Well, good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting of this term of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Uh, members and the public, of course, should switch off their phones, as I've said. Uh, agenda item one is subordinate legislation. Uh, first item today is for the committee to consider two negative instruments as listed on the agenda. Members should note that no motion to annul has been received in relation to the instruments. I refer you to the papers and point out that both of them were uh, given uh, notice to us by the uh, um, fact that they're breaching the 28-day rule and uh, that indeed the sections are explained in the government's responses. Does anyone want to comment? No members want to comment, so therefore um, the committee's agreed it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to these instruments. Are we agreed? Thank you very much. Well, let's move to agenda item two on agricultural issues. Um, the second item today uh, is to take an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary on agricultural issues and uh, the session is divided into four different parts. On First of all, on rent reviews. Secondly, on agricultural holdings issues. Thirdly, on the Salvis and Riddle case. And fourthly, on the common agriculture policy. Now, since this is a catch-up briefing, uh, the Cabinet Secretary may want to, to remember that he can introduce uh, the matters in each section when we come to them so that we can make sure that uh, we get uh, a focused discussion. So the first section in these uh, is about rent reviews. And uh, good morning and welcome to you and your team. Do you want to say anything about rent reviews just now, uh, Richard? Uh, thank you very much, <coughs> convener. And I look forward to uh, speaking to you this morning about a range of uh, issues very important to the future of Scotland's rural communities and agriculture sector. Uh, and it's also a beautiful day outside, so I hope it's a, a good sign that a year today will be just as beautiful uh, in terms of the weather. Can I kick off by saying that in terms of agricultural holdings and the forthcoming review and the future of tenancies in Scotland, that the Scottish Government is very much committed to creating a vibrant tenancy sector in this country. We also want to provide opportunities for new entrants and people who want to farm. To be successful in securing that aim, we need to create the right climate for agricultural tenancies to innovate and to flourish. And <clears throat> clearly, one of the reasons why some of these issues are high up our agenda is because, uh, as Cabinet Secretary, uh, in recent years, I've become increasingly frustrated and disappointed by the trend in agricultural tenancies in Scotland. Uh, I feel that I've given the industry ample, opp ample opportunity over the past five years in particular to create the conditions necessary to deliver upon my aspirations. But that has not happened, and both numbers and tenanted area uh, in terms of the statistics in Scotland uh, have continued to fall. In fact, the published figures for 2012 indicate the number of holdings with tenancies stood at 6,670, the lowest we have ever observed. This represents an 11% decrease since 2005. So I'm committed to trying to address that situation. It's a tricky, complicated uh, situation. But we are committed to reviewing the effectiveness of the Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act 2012. And we said we would start that within 18 months of the Act coming into force. <clears throat> and that's now what we intend to do. So that commitment provides us, all of us, with the ideal opportunity to consider what changes are required to policy and legislation to enable the achievement of a vibrant tenanted farming sector in this country. So I will soon be making an announcement on how to tackle the review, how to take it forward, uh, and the, the timetable for that. But today I do want to confirm that I, I intend to take forward the review as a ministerially led review, rather than an external review, and I will be appointing the review group members uh, in due course. Amongst other things, I would anticipate that the review will include consideration of the future strategic direction for tenant farming, the outputs of the Tenant Farming Forum work plans, including proposals relating to rent reviews, assignation succession arrangements, provision and maintenance of fixed equipment, legal compensation arrangements, diversification issues and dispute resolution. And of course, I would intend to address any other issues that will be raised during the review, including any issues that the TFF, that's the Tenant Farming Forum, has not been able to reach consensus on. However, as the committee will also be aware, 
I have also agreed to include consideration of the absolute right to buy. The absolute right to buy of tenant farms raises strong views across Scotland. Some, of course, state that this issue is the elephant in the room for tenant farming, and it is now time to bring it out into the open and have a full and frank debate in Scotland about the future of our tenancies and the role of absolute right to buy. Others suggest, of course, that the issue relates directly to the diversification of land ownership in Scotland, given that many argue, um, as I have done in the past, that land ownership in Scotland is far too concentrated. And, of course, many farmers across Scotland, tenant farmers, have ex expressed to me the concern that the current state of play very much stifles investment in farming businesses. So these issues have led me to believe that it is now time to have this discussion out into the open. It is inconceivable that the issue of absolute right to buy for tenant farmers should not be considered alongside other issues affecting tenant farming in Scotland. And that should be taken into account as part and parcel of the review of agricultural holdings legislation. And in terms of the scope of that review, I do want to say today, for the avoidance of any doubt, that the consideration of absolute right to buy will be restricted to secure 1991 agricultural tenancies. And given the current land reform debate in rural Scotland, we do need to consider what is in the best interest of the rural communities and the role individual land ownership, of course, plays in this. It's also important that we give all tenant farmers and stakeholders the opportunity to enter into full and frank dialogue about absolute right to buy as we explore how we might free up the inertia, the real inertia, within the tenant farming sector and our options to increase the amount of churn in the sector. An important source of information on absolute right to buy and the other part of the review will be the forthcoming research which will aim to fill the data and information gaps in tenant farming. So key research elements of that project will include surveys to gain improved understanding of the views and experiences of tenant farmers themselves and indeed landlords on a range of tenant farming issues, such as absolute right to buy, but also other issues that I've mentioned, such as rent reviews and wago compensation. Elements will also include uh, gaining an improved understanding of other countries' land tenure arrangements. I think it's important we look to learn what happens in other countries. Also, the further quantifying of the, of the level and nature and type of tenure arrangements in Scotland in, in 2012, uh, as we consider this issue in 2013 going into 2014. And gaining an understanding of the historical reasons for change in that tenure arrangement over time, and also gaining an improved understanding of the impacts of absolute right to buy on tenant farmers, landlords, the taxpayers, eh, and the wider economy. So part of these research outputs will then feed into the review group's consideration of how to address rent reviews. Eh, and you'll be aware that the rent review group concluded its work and made its initial recommendations to both the TFF and myself back in November 2012. Following on from this, the committee received evidence from the Rent Review Working Group and stakeholders in March this year. At the time of the evidence session, the committee was informed that a formal TFF and Scottish Government response would not be expected before June 2013. We had originally expected to receive the outputs of the TFF work streams earlier, including the TFF's final views and rent reviews. Uh, this would enable a response and rent reviews to feed into the review of agricultural holdings legislation. Uh, but other TFF work streams, including legal compensation uh, and the other issues I mentioned, uh, are also uh, in the pipeline. Also, good progress is, has and continues to be made by the TFF. Its final recommendations are now not expected, however, until October. Uh, so here and now I can uh, recap on the main recommendations by the Rent Review Working Group, which I know are uh, of, of relevance to this discussion. Uh, and of course, we'd be glad to discuss the Scottish Government's interim position in each of these areas. So just to recap, the main recommendations made were no adjustment of Section 13 of the 1991 Act, but attempt to improve operation of the existing rent review formula in light of the clarification provided in the Moonsey decision. Also improved understanding of Section 13 of the 1991 Act by developing a layperson's and practitioner's guides and an explanatory note to be sent out with all rent review notices. And also to improve access to comparable rents by establishing and maintaining a voluntary rent register and to accelerate the process and reduce the cost of dispute resolution, and also finally to develop an alternative dispute resolution procedure of arbitration or expert determination. So I know these issues are quite complex, and it's, uh, uh, there's no simple answers to some of these very tricky issues that have bogged down the tenancy debates in Scotland perhaps for generations, uh, but I think we are making progress on some issues, 
But of course, as I indicated, there's a lot of progress made in other issues and a lot of somewhat controversial debates that it's now time to bring out into the open as part of this debate uh, as we move forward. So I'm happy to take questions from the, the committee. Thank you for teeing up that part. Very important uh, uh, indicators of uh, ways in which the government intends to move. Um, I'd like to ask you at the moment then, what are your views, Cabinet Secretary, on the relationship between landlords and tenants in Scotland at present? <coughs> Many of the issues that have plagued the tenancy debate in Scotland over the past few years, of course, have arisen from disputes between tenants and landlords. Clearly, one instigation of these disputes is regularly the rent reviews that take place. Uh, there are many other issues as well that can sometimes cause grievances between uh, tenants and landlords. What I need a better understanding of and what I think the debate needs a better understanding of is whether or not the vast majority of agreements are ticking over just nicely and whether a few sore issues dominate the headlines and dominate our attention. And we have to understand what exactly the lay of land is out there in terms of whether the um, relationships are causing problems right across Scotland, or whether it's just a few examples which tend to, to grab our attention. Uh, and that will guide us as we take forward the discussion over what needs to be fixed in terms of the current legislation or through other means. In that regard, um, the process of rent reviews need to be speeded up and, and uh, you know, there's, there's a, a whole area in there of concern among tenants about the time that it takes to actually get uh, reviews completed. And it's been argued by the Rent Review Group that professional representation is important uh, for both sides in order to speed that process. Um, is there a role for the government to help where either party is not able to meet the cost of this? And do you think that professional representation is the best means to solve these problems? Well, again, very few cases, of course, go right to the land courts or beyond, as we've seen in some cases. Uh, and again, what we have to understand better is whether that is because there are very few cases of that nature or whether there are more cases where there are serious disputes but one, th one party feels it can't afford to go through the whole process, and therefore we never hear about those cases in the courts. Um, but again, there's been a few high-profile court cases uh, where professional representation clearly is required, uh, and that can be very, very expensive. And understandably, when tenant farmers say to me they cannot afford to participate in that process because of the cost involved, uh, notwithstanding the fact that you can apply for legal aid to legal representation, uh, you know, that is clearly a, a serious factor in this whole debate, is the affordability of going through the whole legal process. So in simple uh, cases, we're talking about the difficulty of people actually being able to find the wherewithal to contest things. And the, d does the review intend to look at simplifying the legal uh, approaches to uh, settling these things when they do come to the land court for a start? Well, there's no doubt that dispute resolution will be one of the key issues in the review. But, of course, we have seen the Rent Review Group reporting in terms of the time it takes for rent reviews that you're referring to, a convener, and other issues that arise from rent reviews, which can be quite painful at times. And the Rent Review Group now is undertaking good work, or at least the bodies that are taking forward the recommendations of the group are doing good work in terms of better guidance for both the tenant farmers and the practitioners. And we are helping to fund some of these measures to make sure there's good guidance so people understand the system, understand their rights better, and hopefully that will empower them to you know, have more of a say in, the, in, in these uh, discussions in terms of, from the tenant farmer's perspective. Uh, and also one of the recommendations was to have a transparent register of rents from across the country so that there's more comparables out there again, to empower um, certain parties within these negotiations. Uh, that's still to make some headway, but the, at least the, the guidance and the practitioner's guides are now being published or put together. So hopefully that will make a difference um, and arm 
parties with the information and knowledge <coughs> they require to fight their cases or argue their case. So professional representation is very expensive, but again, we've also seen the Scottish Agricultural Arbiters and Values Association, if you give them their, their proper name, come up with a, a shortened arbitration process uh, as one potential route for people to go down, which would avoid expensive court processes. So there's a lot of thought being given to this by the sector, but clearly it's something we're going to have to touch upon in terms of review. Yeah, it looks as though the, the RICs and uh, their members are a growing industry in this country of uh, trying to solve problems that are increasingly difficult uh, and that maybe indeed uh, the simplification that you just explained might be a great help in that. We want to tease out some more of these issues about how to make <coughs> it easier. Uh, Nigel Don. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. It's good to see you. Um, as you've mentioned, timing is, is, is quite important in, in this sort of thing, and if you start the negotiation early enough, you have a better chance. I'm wondering if I can just look at the, the Rent Review Group's recommendation about a code of conduct, which is what I think they actually recommended, whereas we now seem to be talking about a guide. Um, can I ask, first of all, when you think that guide will actually be issued, please, um, and what your thoughts are on it being, as I understand it, a guide rather than a code of practice, which would have perhaps some formal weight. <coughs> well, yes, that work is underway, and the code of practice was suggested, and also some tenant farming organisations suggested that the code of practice should be underpinned by statute. Mm -hmm. So clearly that's one issue we should look at as part of the review as we look to future legislation of, as to whether or not there's a case for underpinning the code of practice uh, in statute, which would then mean that it could be referred to in any court proceedings in the future. It would be a material consideration of, as to whether or not the code of practice was adhered to by the various parties. Uh, <coughs> and the guidance which I referred to is being published and is, well, I think, the there's a good practice guide for uh, rent reviews, which is a general document. There's also um, a document for the practitioners themselves, which we're helping to fund as well, and that's currently being put together at the moment, I understand. So the Rent Review Working Group did some good work by making those recommendations, and the recommendations uh, in the main are being fulfilled, other than the one which is causing some difficulties about the transparent register of rents from across the country. And the debate there has been trying to find an impartial body that can take responsibility for that. So there's some work underway just now to take that forward as well. Do, do you, how's the Scottish Government going to be able to monitor the effect of the guide once it's, or the guides and codes of practices, let's just put them all together depending on which organisation it comes from. Uh, how are you going to be able to monitor that in the future? And I guess the follow-up question to that is going to be, well, over what kind of period are you going to have to monitor it before you can form some intelligent views on whether or not it's working, do you think? Well, clearly we'll do our best to monitor it. Uh, you know, like every other issue in the, this debate, you know, we will no doubt learn about disputes, as we always do. And if these disputes have arisen despite the fact that this new work has been undertaken in terms of giving people better guidance, a new code of practice, etc., then clearly we'd have to understand why these disputes are still happening. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what more we can do to monitor other than remain engaged with our stakeholders mm -hmm. and just, you know, monitor how many disputes there are uh, across the country. Okay, thank you. Um, just a moment, Nigel. Uh, uh, Alec Ferguson wants a point on, on that bit. And then back to you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, convener. Um, when we took evidence, Cabinet Secretary, good morning, by the way. When we took evidence from the uh, Rent Review Group, um, they put it to us quite strongly, I think, that they felt um, that if you took a lot of the mystique and the almost the fear factor, if you like, out of the current rent review system, you would remove a lot of the potential for conflict that you, you've referred to. Um, do, do you agree with that? Yes, I do agree with that. Uh, I'm not saying this is the only factor, but mm. I do agree with that statement. And also that's why we did support taking forward the recommendations in terms of these new guides for, you know, there's a layman's guide, there's a petitioner's guide, etc. 
because information can arm parties within these uh, negotiations. And quite clearly, tenant farmers are tenant farmers. They're busy being farmers, not necessarily experts in tenancy laws and their rights and responsibilities, etc., etc., in terms of what they may require to have at hand if they're going through a dispute resolution or a dispute, uh, rent dispute or whatever. Therefore, the more information we can have in the hands of tenant farmers so they understand what their rights are uh, and <coughs> that may give them confidence of how to, you know, go through a dispute uh, and hopefully reach a resolution, then the better. Can I just very briefly follow that up? Thank you. Um, thank you for that reply. I, I, I'm sure you would agree that there are many, many examples of where, where rent reviews are settled quite amicably. Uh, between landlord and tenant, um, and I just wonder what work has been done to identify why there are many examples that are perfectly happily settled, and what the difference is between that relationship and the one that, and the ones that end up in conflict. <laughs> because it surely is very important to understand the difference. It is important to understand the difference, uh, and that's why we are going to survey Scotland's tenant farmers to find out their experiences. But there are other rural MSPs sitting around this committee table, as well as myself. I know from personal experience as a member for a rural constituency in this parliament that there is a fear factor among some tenant farmers. Often there are situations where there's an absentee landlord who takes no interest or next to no interest in their estate, certainly next to no interest in the fortunes of the tenant farmers on their estate, would much rather have no tenant farmers in their estate because anyone else being in their estate seems an inconvenience. That's clearly not healthy for agriculture. It's not healthy for local communities and local economies. So there are circumstances that can arise, perhaps from absentee landlords or other situations, that do lead to uh, very unhappy scenarios um, you know, for tenant farmers. And therefore, uh, these are some circumstances where things are not going well. But clearly, where the landlord has got a constructive, positive relationship with their tenants, there's happiness all round. And I know many estates where that's the case as well in Scotland. And my contention is simply that we need to learn from the good examples to, to better understand how to deal with the bad ones. Yeah, and of course, the challenge always facing legislators is how you can legislate for the bad cases without trying to impact too much on the good cases. Indeed. But sometimes Indeed. there's just no way around that. Graham yeah. Day. Thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I, I wonder, how confident are you that, given the fear factor that we're talking about here amongst the tenant sector, that the review will get to the truth? Is there not a danger that some tenants, at least, will feel intimidated into not revealing the true situation they're encountering? Again, it's very disappointing. There is a fear factor in tenant farming in Scotland, and that's symptomatic of the... Uh, the place we've reached, unfortunately, in terms of the future of, of tenant farming in Scotland. But it also shows that there's something wrong with the current system and we are in that situation. Uh, we will have to find ways as part of the review of ensuring we get good, genuine evidence through the survey and we encourage people to bring forward their cases to us. I've already had, as you can imagine, that uh, lots of farmers across Scotland have um, personally contacted me with their own experiences, um, as indeed have landlords with their views as well. So irrespective of the, the fear in some businesses that there may be some sort of repercussions if they were to speak out against the landlords, there are tenant farmers out there willing to share their experiences uh, on a confidential basis. And of course, the responses to the survey that we are going to be carrying out uh, will be treated with confidence as well. So we'd encourage all farmers to let us have their views, okay. their positive experiences, and their perhaps not so positive experiences. Okay, thank you. That's useful. Did you have another point well, here? I, I yes, did. Please. It, it does, I think, just draw them all to together, actually, uh, because, because Cabinet Secretary, clearly, clearly there are these sort of psychological elements which we can't legislate for. But I am just interested to know whether you feel that the guides and codes that will come out uh, soon will actually add up to a comprehensive picture of how it should be done in such a way that at least a tenant farmer can look at that and say, well, I do know everything about what we should be doing. 
whether that will be comp comprehensive and therefore allow at least some transparency in the process. Do you, do you see that as being a complete statement of, of what the process should be? Yes, I'm very keen to use this review to have a generational look at the future of tenant farming. And I've been in this job six stroke seven years, and I've learned a lot about some of the big issues in tenant farming in Scotland, about the relationships between tenant farmers and landlords, about the need to have tenancies in Scotland to give an opportunity for new entrants or for existing families to continue farming in the land, produce food for the country. And also, we want to encourage the positive relationships that are out there, of which there are many, between landlords and tenants at the same time. So we have got to use this opportunity to hopefully come up with some solutions they may be out-of-the-box solutions, they may be radical solutions, but I think this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity, and I hope we can just get it right this time and address some of the issues that you're raising in this committee. Yep. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to a different subject now, Jim Hume. Yeah, thank you very much, convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, yes, uh, the formula for determining rents, it's, it's been referred to as a bit of a black art. Uh, at the moment, as you know, it's, it's based on a notional market uh, for comparable holdings, perhaps scarce, scarcity of lets, and perhaps something that's called marriage value. If it's a neighbouring farm letting a, a neighbouring farm, then th there's economies of scale there. The rent review groups, I don't know if they're happy with it, but they're not recommending any, any changes to that, whereas the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association would be happier with the this more English system where the rents are based on productive capacity. What's your views on where we should go with how to determine values of rent? Well, one of the reasons why I supported the setting up of the Rent Review Group is so that we could have a panel looking at these issues. And, of course, mm -hmm. they made the recommendations. The recommendation was that the, the rent test, if you like, how you decide the rent, should not be changed via legislation. There's legislation there already. There are criteria that should be used in the existing acts. And of course, they expressed the view that there were perhaps people out there not using those tests properly that are already there, or for other reasons, not following good practice. And therefore, it wasn't legislation that needed changed it was the behaviour of the practitioners, or a certain, perhaps, minority of practitioners and, and, under, and tenant farmers themselves understanding their rights and what the test should be according to legislation and getting that um, information out there so that uh, the, the perhaps few cases, for all we know, that are causing disputes uh, can hopefully be avoided <coughs> because if the people just go through things in the correct manner, and adhere to legislation that's already there, then hopefully disputes would not occur. So it's a tough one. I mean, I understand the position of the tenant farmers because they're quite clearly saying that you have to look at the individual circumstances of the tenancy, uh, whereas most rent reviews take into account comparators elsewhere in, in tenant farming and across the country. Uh, and there's an element of sense to that as well. So, again, all I can do is listen to views during the review and see if there's a case for revisiting this. Uh, but at the moment, you know, I think we can hope that the measures that are being taken with the guidance that's been issued will make a difference. Is there any, sorry, through the chair, of course, uh, is there any particular measures you would think that could po possibly help with good practice uh, being encouraged better? I mean, well, the only issue like at the back of my mind, which I did refer to earlier, is whether or not the code of practice, once it's there, mm -hmm. should be underpinned by statute. Right. So I think that's something we should look at as part of the review. Okay. Because then those that are perhaps not following good practice would be encouraged to do so because it could be used against them in court if it was underpinned by statute. Okay, thanks. That's useful. Thank you. Uh, Claudia, be mission a supplementary in this one. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, could I seek some clarification about um, your, your view on Section 13 as to whether you would um, be minded to consider um, looking at that 
part of the legislation again in, uh, in spite of what I understand to be the recommendation of the rent review. In terms of the rents test, mm -hmm. <coughs> well, I can only refer to my previous answer in that I don't have a closed mind. Yeah. And if there's a code of practice, and I said before, you know, if we underpinned that by statute, that was maybe strengthen uh, the obligation mm -hmm. on practitioners to make sure they are adhering to the code of practice. Mm -hmm. So I think that could help. Uh, and likewise, I I'm open to views from this committee uh, or from stakeholders as to whether or not that needs revisited. Um, but, you know, we did have the review group and it did make its recommendations. And it's, as I said before, uh, you know, in my opening remarks, it's always difficult to ascertain whether there's a few difficult cases that are grabbing all our, all our attention, but the vast majority of rent reviews are going along swimmingly. And therefore, you know, do we have to change the legislation if there's just a few cases affected, if they could be addressed in other ways? Or do we have to change the legislation? I, I, I keep an open mind on that. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, Richard Lyle, next. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Firstly, can I, I don't think anyone's mentioned this. Can I welcome your statement this morning and your determination, as always, to uh, take matters forward on behalf of the farming community? Um, can, I, can I turn to the factor of establishing a register for uh, Nagavati farm tenancies and rents? Um, one of the recommendations of the Rent Review Group uh, was that a register of rent should be set up. And the committee has previously had evidence that uh, the information should go into a register, whether it was voluntary or not, and who should keep it. Uh, and we've also received information that a survey of NFUS members had revealed strong support for a register. And there was a possibility that the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Scotland Bill may require this information. Can I therefore ask you, how establishing a reg register with information about farming tenancies and rents can be seriously taken forward by the Scottish Government in order to resolve this important issue? And will it be included in the review that you have already mentioned this morning in your statement? <clears throat> so that's one recommendation you're referring to of the rent review group that's not been taken forward at the same pace as the other recommendations. Yeah. Uh, and this is because the industry felt that they were not best placed to set up the register themselves. So therefore, government has been working to identify a more impartial, neutral body that could host the register. And that's what we're actively doing just now. So we're speaking to the registers of Scotland, for instance, as to whether or not they would be the appropriate host for such a, a voluntary register. Uh, and we hope to be able to have some sort of resolution to that very soon and that will enable then the register to be set up and get going. Do you think it should be voluntary or do you think we should actually uh, make it mandatory? Well, my understanding is, and I'll ask Fiona here, Fiona Leslie, to correct me if I'm wrong, that the recommendation would be for a voluntary register from the Rent Review Group. So I would have to canvas views from the industry as to whether or not that's, there's a demand for it to be compulsory, but I'm not sure how you'd have to, you'd be placing an obligation on thousands of businesses to, to register their rents. Whereas what we're looking for are for some comparators and therefore uh, having a voluntary register would get us at least some comparators onto the register, which then when there's rent reviews taking place, they can refer to that. So it doesn't necessarily have to be every single rent compulsory registered. We just need some examples out there so that others can refer to them. So that's why I think at the moment, we're not of a mind to go down any compulsory route and just adhere to the recommendation to have a, a voluntary approach. But again, would you not agree if you just make it voluntary that no one would need to honestly uh, give that information? Uh, well, again, you know, the Rent Review Group considered these issues and made the recommendation. And I guess there's nothing to prevent people putting alternative views to the review once it's underway. OK, thank you. Your next number. No, nope, we've done it. I think we've covered uh, the next point, but uh, Alec Ferguson wants to take up uh, some issues yes, with th you. Thank you, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, in your opening remarks, you were mentioning that the amount or the number of tenanted holdings has dropped since, 19, since 2005 by about 11%, I think was the figure you said. Um, 
in, again, in evidence to us, Phil Thomas suggested that while he didn't have the full details available, um, he felt that some of that drop could be attributed to uh, tenanted holdings amalgamating, um, and, and that, uh, I think, um, what did you refer to it, marriage units or something? Marriage. Um, and I, I just wondered whether you had any information that you could give us about the amount of actual land that is still tenanted, as opposed to the number of uh, agricultural holdings, tenanted holdings. Yes, there are figures over the amount of land under tenancy. So at the moment we have 25% of agricultural land in Scotland, that's 1.4 million hectares, uh, are rented out under tenancies of more than one year. Uh, the figure was 40% back in 1982. So I can give you some kind of indication of the reduction in the amount of land that's been tenanted, uh, at least since 1982 until the, the recent times. Uh, and in terms of the reasons behind that, of course, there's a whole variety of reasons. And that's why, as part of this debate, we have to have a better understanding of those reasons. And hopefully the survey that we're going to carry out of, of farmers will help identify some of those reasons. So you know, it can be a whole range of reasons. It can be amalgamation of tenancies. It can be no successor in place if the sitting tenant dies and therefore it's taken back in hand by the estate or the landowner. And, you know, you know there's other reasons as well. So there's no clear-cut explanation as to why there's been a decline in tenancies. But what we do know that is if we want a vibrant tenancy sector in Scotland, then we have to uh, look at this issue seriously in terms of making sure there's opportunities available for, for aspiring tenant farmers in Scotland. You several times mentioned the, the, the term a viable tenanted sector, and, and uh, I, I'm on record right over the years of saying that that is in everybody's interest to have a viable and, and healthy tenanted sector. I cannot disagree with that at all. How, how do you define a, a healthy tenanted sector? What's your definition of that? <coughs> well, my definition of a healthy tenanted sector is where there are good positive relationships between uh, tenants and their landlords, where there is uh, a number of tenancies coming on stream, providing opportunities for aspiring tenant farmers in Scotland, and where there's an, an environment of productivity on the farm and attracting investment. And I think that would hopefully be a good formula for a vibrant tenant sector in Scotland. Uh, clearly, that may be the case in some parts of Scotland at the moment, but it's certainly not the case in all parts. Well, I, I'm delighted to say that for once I 100% agree with you on that definition. I would entirely that worries agree. me that maybe I've got that wrong then. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think occasionally one's allowed to agree on these things. But, but, but I wonder if, if you would agree that the achievement of that level of, 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 of um, viability in the sector, if I can put it that way, is dependent on uh, an element of trust between all parties involved that for some reason over the years has been lost. And what I think I'm really asking is, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that is the case, there has to be trust between both parties if, if this sector is to be revived. Um, and if it, it how, how can this process go about restoring the trust, an awful lot of which has been lost over the past decade? How can we go about restoring that trust through this process? Well, one of the reasons why I'm keen on this review and I want it to be a significant review is because it's now time to clear, clear the air and have a full and frank debate. And that, I think, will help the whole debate and help relationships. It will help everyone understand what the key issues are. And then, hopefully, the sector can just move forward after the review is complete and the necessary changes have been made, if we get them right. So I think that's the best opportunity to achieve what you may refer to as trust. I may refer to as just trying to pin down the key issues, clear the air and address the issues and move on. So do you, do you see the end process of this review being effectively drawing a line under the tensions of the past, being able to draw a line under the tensions of the past and saying this is the way we move forward 
and, and, and you know, people can move forward now on both sides of the tenancy um, equation, um, knowing that, that, that this is the way we go forward and, and we don't visualise other changes. Well, what I'd hope for is that everyone will know where they stand uh, once the review is complete and any changes uh, made to legislation or, or otherwise. Of course, I cannot guarantee to remove tensions between landlords and tenants. That's part and parcel of the land ownership patterns we have in Scotland and the tenure we have in Scotland. Uh, and it would be naive for me to sit here and say all tensions are going to be uh, addressed by a review of agricultural holdings legislation. We have a lot of historical baggage in this country. We've got concentrated patterns of land ownership. We have, therefore, as part of that, landlord tenant relationships. And uh, if I were able to address issues such as absentee landlordism overnight, I'd perhaps do that. Uh, and no doubt the wider land reform agenda will be discussing and, and addressing these issues. But you know, as long as we have situations such as absentee landlords, which I can't say we're going to fix overnight, uh, then clearly these tensions are still going to be there. Uh, the situations I've experienced in my constituency of landlords uh, living outside of Scotland, taking not the least bit of interest in the well-being of the tenant farmers and their estates, uh, that's not going to be solved overnight, but we do have to address it if we can. Uh, so these tensions are not going to disappear. Thank you. And there are three supplementaries. First of all, Jim Hume, then Claudia Beamish, and then myself. Thanks very much, Convener. I was quite alarmed at the, the 1982 figure uh, going from 40% of uh, uh, Scotland's farmed land being tenanted to a uh, to up-to-date figure of 25%. That's quite a, a dramatic uh, drop, of course. Um, of course, there has been land reform. There has been, I know, quite a lot of um, concern drummed up by, by certain factors about... <coughs> absolute right to buy extending into limited duration tenancies and you've quite rightly said that it would be totally restricted to 1991 tenancies if 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 anything um so uh, and uh, as i said alex ferguson has mentioned trust have you had much feedback that the part of the reason that the drop in tenanted farm has been has been a, a fear perhaps of the landlords losing their land to any, any type of tenure through absolute right to buy? All I've had over the last few months is one or two anecdotal examples, and when we've investigated them, what we've discovered are there are many other business reasons of why plans have been changed. So I think there's a lot of scaremongering going on just now by opponents of absolute right to buy, for instance, who are saying that as long as this is part of any debate, we're not going to put land to let on the market. Mm -hmm. But when you investigate, what you find is that they're actually waiting for the outcome of the common agricultural policy negotiations to find out what it will mean for the economics of the farming business, etc., mm -hmm. etc., et or other plans have just simply changed uh, with their business. But it's a convenient hook if they're an opponent of uh, looking at these issues to put that into the public domain. So I would... Uh, I regret any scaremongering by any particular uh, estates across the country. And the whole issue of uncertainty has been around for as long as I've been involved in politics. Uh, this isn't something new. This is a, a kite that's flown by uh, certain individuals across Scotland uh, for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, therefore, uh, whilst... You have to pay attention to those claims. I think we just have to move on with the debate. Okay, thanks. Um, Thank you, Convener. There's been now quite wide-ranging discussion um, and your helpful remarks at the beginning uh, about the, the review. Um, I was reassured to hear that even if there hasn't been consensus on issues, that those uh, will be looked at um, in view of some, some comments that have come to me. Um, there was disappointment, as you know, that the Land Reform Review Group wouldn't be looking at the, um, at the issue um, in relation to tenant farmers. And I wonder that the degree um, to which... Was it your intention um, that ARTB would be considered as part of this review all along? Um, and if not, what led you to change your mind? How did that development happen, if you would be able to well, explain all, that to us? Yeah. <coughs> Clearly... As you know, one of the 
flagship policy of the Scottish Parliament has been the Land Reform Act, and that's because <coughs> Scotland for a long time wanted the restoration of a national parliament to address long-standing uh, problems in society, one of which was the pattern of land ownership uh, in this country, which is there because of historical reasons. But to, in terms of empowering communities and empowering individuals, uh, diverse land ownership is one way forward. Uh, and also that is uh, one way to open the door to better rural development uh, as well. In terms of tenant farming and the absolute right to buy, there's always been the debate as to whether that's uh, part of the debate over the future of tenant farming in Scotland and agriculture, or it should be left to a silo of land reform debate. But the two can't really be divided from each other, can they? Because if you're talking about the future of tenant farmers, and some tenant farmers are on secure tenancies, and they are arguing for the right to buy their tenancy, because it's, they've had it within, within the family for generations, and they intend to be there for future generations, but they want the ability to invest in their own enterprises and have more control over their own destinies, then clearly that is related to agriculture and the future of tenancies. So I do feel this is an appropriate vehicle to take forward that debate. Clearly it featured in the previous debate in this parliament back in 2003, and therefore there's a precedent for the absolute right to buy to feature in the future of the agricultural holdings legislation. The timing is good because there's a wider land reform debate taking place in Scotland as well. And the Land Reform Review Group are looking at a whole range of issues. Uh, and given that we were already committed to this review in any case, um, and because there is a precedent, therefore you know, it makes sense for us to incorporate the absolute right to buy in our review. Thank you. And, and just briefly, um, Cabinet Secretary, in your opening remarks, I, I believe I'm correct in, in saying that you said that there would be some gathering of facts and figures in relation to this review. Um, and could you tell us a bit more about what that process will be and how that will inform the review? I will announce <coughs> in the next month or so the timetable and the remit for the review. And at the same time, we'll be commissioning research and the surveys I mentioned before which will then take place over the coming months. So it'll work in parallel to the work of the review group, but clearly as the review group makes progress, it will be further informed by the outcome of the surveys and the research that's been undertaken. Uh, as Alec Ferguson mentioned, there's various reasons that's led to the decline in the amount of agri agricultural land under tenancy in Scotland. Uh, and it's difficult to have official statistics and all these myriad of reasons, so we have to just ha undertake the research and surveys to understand it better. Uh, and <coughs> therefore, that's important to have that to inform the review group's work as it moves forward. Right, well, I'll just take, this, wait a minute, yes, Jim, Thanks, Jim. certainly. We seem to be very much guided by the rent review group, if I'm, if, if I'm correct here. Uh, and just uh, regarding the absolute right to buy for 1991 tenancies, uh, was, did the rent review group uh, recommend uh, absolute right to buy for 1991 tenancies as part of their reviewing? Uh, sorry, uh, did the rent review group that's reported just a few yes, months uh, ago? Yes, was, was it out of their recommendations? No. no. No, that wasn't part of their remit to look okay, at that. That's right. yeah. Okay, thank you. On that subject. Um, I'm very pleased about your announcement this morning that uh, you're going to look at the issues related to the right to buy for 1991 tenancies. Now, this assumes that uh, other kinds of tenancies will still continue. And unless they become 1991 tenancies, there won't be a right to buy. I'm assuming that line of logic. So, uh, Cabinet Secretary, <clears throat> There's another argument that says that landlords won't let land and aren't letting land at the moment because of that fear. Well, once the right to buy issue is dealt with, it's been suggested by Andy Whiteman that indeed landlords will want to rent land in order to make income. So would you envisage some situation where um, tenancies that were let in those circumstances uh, would not 
uh, reach a stage where they had a right to buy. Um, I, I agree with that. I think that we have to focus on the secure tenancies in terms of the debate over the right to buy. But at the same time, we're arguing for a vibrant tenancy sector in Scotland. Therefore, we want land to come onto the market to let. And there are options available for the, the, the time, time scale and the nature of tenancies. We've got limited duration tenancies uh, and other kinds of tenancies. So we have to have this balance of creating an environment in which tenancies are created in Scotland and made available but we have a debate over the right to buy of secure tenancies from 1991 Acts. And it's important that we strike that balance. And that's why you know, I'm saying today that the debate over right to buy applies to 1991 tenancies, but we have a whole range of issues to look at to improve other tenancies, to make them more attractive, to let, uh, and also to make them work better. Could I suggest, uh, I get your views about this, in parallel in crofting, there is law now to create new uh, tenanted crofts, but without any right to buy. So there is an incentive to landlords to make new crofts, which they know they won't lose the land on. Might that be a means for your review to think about the ways in which other tenancies might be able to be viewed in future? Well, yes, I think it will provide that opportunity. And there is, a, of course, a debate out there as to how the right to buy debate relates to other tenancies. In other words, if you reach a, a view on the right to buy, then that would free up the ability to think out the box about how other tenancies in Scotland operate and what kind of tenancies we could perhaps create in the future. And the review group should look at that. Yeah. Okay, Claudia Beamish wanted to come in at this point. You didn't? Thank okay. you very much. You're just nodding. Good. I'm glad we agree. Um, in that case, we move on to the next question, which I think uh, Alec Ferguson's going to lead on, if there's any parts Is of he? the left. Uh, question 10. I don't think he was convinced. Okay. <laughs> if that's the case, Graham Day will lead then. And he <laughs> come in on it. Uh, first, Karen, I, said, I wonder if we can just look briefly at the environment in which this review is going to take place. And in, in the latest edition of the STFA newsletter, Christopher Nicholson, their chair, expresses the hope that the review will attract, and I quote, some rational discussion, end quote, on the future of land tenure in Scotland. A sentiment I'm sure we would all agree with. But given the intransigence of Scottish land and estates on land reform, as was articulated by their chief executive, Doug McAdam, in a recent edition of Scottish Field, is that a realistic prospect? And if we cannot have ra rational discussion, how can we make progress? Well, I can make the obvious statement, which is, yes, I would like to encourage rational discussion <laughs> in this debate. Uh, but clearly, it's a very emotive subject. It's about, uh, in the case of absolute right to buy, it's about land ownership. Mm -hmm. It's about the uh, pattern of ownership in Scotland. Uh, it touches on the whole... Uh, range of uh, important issues to the kind of country we want to live in. Uh, but I appeal for all sides to work towards the objectives we all share, which is uh, what's best for farming businesses, mm -hmm. what's best for the landlord-tenant relationship, um, and what's best for wider agriculture and land use in, in Scotland, uh, as well as land ownership. And you know, like so many other walks of life, I can point to landlords who are very good landlords, and I can point to landlords who are not so good landlords, and I'm sure it's the case with their tenants as well. Therefore, um, I, I can't uh, <laughs> order people to have a rational debate, but the more rational we are and the less wild accusations we have moving forward, the better the environment will be to have a good, sensible, intelligent debate moving forward to identify what's best for the tenancy sector in Scotland for Scotland's lands uh, and for uh, wider <coughs> agriculture and land use. Okay. Thank you. If I may convene on, yeah. just, just exploring the point about good ideas that come forward. The, the concern that some people express about absolute right to buy is the possible negative impact it might have on new entrants. But uh, in the same STFA publication, Gilbert Bannerman suggests setting up a land commission with a view to any farms that are 
being bought under absolute right to buy, which then come on the market, would be sold to the Commission, who in turn would sell to a suitable new entrant, or alternatively, the Land Commission would, through a share farming system, marry up a new entrant with a farmer who's willing to go down this route. Is this, and I know something like this was suggested many years ago, is this something that's worthy of consideration? I've actually read Gilbert Bannerman's article, and what I find very encouraging is that now we have young farmers like Gilbert out there thinking about how to address a situation of opening up opportunities for new entrants in farming in Scotland. And there are a lot of really imaginative solutions being put forward by a range of people. And all I can say at this stage is I do think we have to think out the box. And I do think we have to use our imaginations and creativity to find solutions to opening up opportunities for the next generation of farmers in Scotland. Uh, therefore, I welcome that contribution to the debate. I don't know if it's the answer. And other people, as I said before, are also coming out with answers or are pr pr proposed solutions as well. Uh, and I am now of the belief we're at a stage with this debate where we do have to have some radical solutions. And as you know, we've been using some creativity in government to use publicly owned land to create new starter units on the forestry estate. And we're looking at how to expand that. The wider Land Reform Review Group are speaking about creating a land agency in Scotland. If that were to be a final recommendation from the review group, we'd have to consider as a government what role a land agency could have in this wider debate of not only encouraging community ownership of land, but also perhaps opening up opportunities for new entrants in agriculture. So I'm quite excited by this debate just now. I'm also excited by the fact there's lots of really good proposals, solutions and thinking happening out there about how we could address this problem. Okay. Thank you, Governor Secretary. Just before I come to the new entrants matter as such, there is a question related to a new entrants and uh, a forestry commission. I think, am I correct? Alec Ferguson. Well, if I, may, I, I, I was going to bring this up later, uh, Cabinet Secretary, it's sort of it's a completely different subject to the one we've just been talking about. But you, you'll be very aware of a situation that's arisen in what was my constituency, but is now in Elaine Murray's constituency in Upper Nithsdale, whereby a new entrant farm in a forestry uh, created farm has recently hit the headlines for all the wrong reasons uh, through the what was termed the dumping of um, human sludge uh, on it in, in fairly copious quantities that appears to not have followed all the guidelines that are meant to be followed um, when, when sludge, human sludge is applied to agricultural land. Um, one, one of the interesting things that came out of that is that when the licence was applied for, one of the reasons for wanting to use this material was to restore the land to fertility following open cast mining. Now, it's 22 years that land has been farmed very happily since it was an open cast coal mine. Um, so there are issues there. And, and uh, uh, the, really, the point I, the reason I wanted to bring it up was I just wondered whether, given this example, which involves Scottish Water, Forestry Commission, and um, uh, uh, For Forestry Commission, Scottish Water, and SEPA, uh, all of which come under your remit, whether you would consider a review of, of this entire human sludge issue, which is clearly, if applied in inappropriate ways, has enormous hazards for in, in many different directions. Well, what I can say to Alec Ferguson is that I'm aware of this issue. It was brought to my attention uh, a week or two ago, and I do treat it seriously. I'm investigating it. It's not unusual, of course, for treated sludge to be used in farmland across the country. Uh, that's perfectly normal, and of course it can improve land. Uh, and it's a convenient way in which to do that that farmers use in, in many circumstances. The case that you raise is being investigated as we speak, and I think what's been investigated at the moment by SEPA, the Environment Agency, is to what extent the regulations were adhered to. So I think I'd have to wait for the outcome of that investigation before deciding whether or not there's change required. But I, I am paying attention to it, and I'm aware of it. But the whole situation is being investigated yes. as we speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm, we've spread it rather further and wider than I expected, but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, we need to spread some more information about new entrants. Um, what information do we have about the number of farmers who have a successor in place? I expect we do not have that information. Uh, again, that's why we have to carry out this survey that we're speaking about, is because there's such a myriad of situations out there, 
and there is no formal way of recording as to whether or not existing tenants have a successor in place. Or indeed, uh, uh, the question may be a general question about um, owner occupiers as well. Uh, so we don't have a system in place that identifies that. And because now the debate over new entrants is becoming so pertinent, we have to understand these issues better. Yeah. Um, following that, um, obviously we've had issues about uh, new entrants perhaps not taking up uh, SRDP opportunities as, as, as many as would have been hoped. Um, have you got any thoughts about that just now? Because, um, Only that we are paying attention to what opportunities should be in the yep. new rural development programme for yep. new entrants. And, you know, we did put the first ever support for new entrants into the current Scotland Rural Development Programme. And a number of farmers have benefited from that, which is good news. Perhaps not as much as we'd have liked, but there are other obstacles facing farmers trying to get into agriculture, not just simply financial support through the Rural Development Programme. Yep. There's getting access to... to tenancies or land in the first place. Uh, so we are keen to ensure that the new rural development programme uh, does support new entrants. Okay, that's good. I mean, we know that the review is going to reveal a lot more information, so we look forward to quizzing you in that when the time comes. But I think we'll, we'll try to move on just now to the Selvis and Riddle case. Um, probably um, you may well wish to say something about that just now. Uh, in the way of an opening uh, set of remarks. Yeah, sure, you want to, I'm happy to say a few remarks about the Salveson uh, Riddle case. Uh, so the committee will be aware that in agricultural tenancies, limited partnerships uh, for some time became widely used as a means of letting farms as it allowed a clear route for the landlord to recover vacant possession. And in 2003, the Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act introduced measures to provide tenants with a period of notice when bringing the limited partnerships to an end. And Section 72 of the 2003 Act allowed the tenant to claim the tenancy, having been served a dissolution notice and provided for the landlord to challenge at the land court. In the test cases, the section was challenged through the courts. The Supreme Court passed a judgment in April 2013 indicating that Section 72 of the Act failed to comply with the ECHR legislation. So helpfully, the Supreme Court suspended their judgment until the 23rd of April 2014 to allow the Scottish Government time to consult with the industry and address how best to provide a solution to these persons uh, whose rights have been breached. So to provide a legal remedy, I've agreed with the law officers to use a European Court of Human Rights compliance order. Uh, the processing of this order will follow a super affirmative parliamentary process which provides for a public consultation of 60 days before the final order is laid before the Parliament. And now we're consulting with stakeholders uh, and have been to identify the number of individuals who perhaps have been affected by the Supreme Court decision. The people who are potentially affected by the judgment are those who served or received a dissolution notice for a limited partnership between 16th of September 2002 and the 30th of June 2003. Now, unfortunately, there are no relevant official records, so there is uncertainty about the number of people affected. However, discussions with stakeholders leads us to believe that there may be an estimate of just over 100 affected farms involved. That's much less than was originally feared. In a significant number of the estimated 100 cases, the tenants and the landlords have reached a mutual agreement and move beyond the need for a legal remedy. Consequently, the number of farms affected by the legal remedy is likely to be well below this number. So the nature of the legal remedy required by the Supreme Court judgment is to have a, a root in law to enable the landlord to recover vacant possession. And the specific details of the legal remedy are currently being worked on by officials uh, with stakeholders. So as I'm no doubt the committee will be aware, this is quite a difficult and sensitive issue especially for those tenant farmers whose livelihoods and homes uh, may be affected. So we want to continue to work closely with the stakeholders to devise solutions that are as fair as possible to all those affected. Uh, and that's where we are uh, at the current time. Thank you for that. We obviously understand uh, that there's a couple of people who want to come in here, but that we're going to have a, a briefing from uh, your officials, yourself, in uh, uh, later in the year, once we uh, have some idea about what you're actually going to do. But 
Uh, from this early stage, there are one or two questions that people want to ask. The first of them from uh, Jim Hume. Oh, oh, thanks very much, uh, convener. I think anybody with a rural section uh, <laughs> to your region will, 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 have, will know of quite a few cases uh, where people have been affected uh, through um, through this uh, legislation. Um, but you, you said that you're aware of a hundred or, or, or so. Um, for m myself to go back to some of my constituents uh, who may not have made themselves aware, who would they make uh, themselves uh, aware to? Would they contact their local Department of Agriculture or would they uh, contact the government in here directly? What information would you look to require from them? You know, what have the legal costs been over the over the years and ongoing legal costs, I know of some quite horrific ongoing legal costs where the landlord and the, uh, and the tenant has got to a situation. If anybody backs down now, then, then they may be liable for the, the other one's legal costs, which is uh, almost into a horrible uh, stalemate sort of, sort of situation. And I'd also be interested in your views on if, whether the government will perhaps be liable for com compensation for some of uh, these tenants that have been affected? Well, for legal reasons, I hope you'll understand, I can't answer all of the questions you've no, just no, posed well, there. Okay. <laughs> uh, however, in the generality, what I'd say is that we've worked from a position where we've got no information, the number of people being affected, therefore we've had to work closely with stakeholders to try and identify those cases where there was uh, dissolution served or limited partnerships and then converted to secure tenancies because of the situation that arose in 2003, where these dissolution notices were served by landlords who were afraid of the potential implications of what might happen in that act at that time, and they wanted to escape those implications. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you know, the Supreme Court found that uh, we, or the, the government at the time, uh, stepped over the mark uh, and so breached the rights of the landowners. So uh, what we have now done is effectively narrowed down to around 100 farms or individuals affected. And as I said before, our understanding of the circumstances of some of those 100 and odd cases are now at a stage where they would not be affected by the need for any legal remedy that would affect them directly. Mm -hmm. So that could be a variety of situations where there's been a mutual agreement about how to move forward amongst the between the landlord and the tenant in that particular circumstance or or where the, the who owns the farm or whatever has just simply moved on and uh, no legal remedies required. So <clears throat> it's a bit sketchy at the moment in terms of exactly how many farmers are affected, but I think when this case was originally uh, decided upon by the courts, we feared there was going to be a lot of people affected. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, the evidence would appear to suggest there's not that many people affected. But, but, but just on that evidence, there may be people who haven't made themselves aware uh, to your departments for, uh, for my constituents that have been affected. Uh, who would I put, put them in touch with? Would I put them directly to yourself or would, would they go through the SGRPID uh, departments? And, and what information should they state? You know, should they right. state well, we're about to write <coughs> actually in the next few days to the farmers we believe are affected. I, I know, but sorry, it's the ones that, you, that you, we don't know about that I, I'm concerned about, the ones that have maybe not uh, made themselves aware to government departments. Uh, yes, I mean, Fiona, do you want to come in there in terms of our... Yep. Okay. Thanks. So there, there are the arrangements we put in place for stakeholders at the moment to try and identify those people and who yes, they can contact. So. So there is recognition that we don't know who these people are, but working through the representatives of the Tenant Farmers Forum, the various bodies there believe that they can help us identify the individuals involved. Um, so they have agreed to help us send out the letter to those affected. Okay. The Tenant Far Far Farmers Forum, that's STFA, that's NFUS. Not everybody's members of that. So again, if it was an individual farmer who's out there, a member of any of our constituencies or regions, do so we tell them to write directly to there is the, Mr Lockhead? Or? Well, clearly, in terms of people who want to self-identify, 
Uh, we will be putting information on the web very shortly about who to contact within the Scottish Government. I will also ensure that that information goes out to members so that you can pass it to constituents and that will give a contact name and number of who they should contact. Okay, that, that, that's exactly what I'm yeah. looking at. If, if we could do that to the no, committee as well. That yeah. yeah, thanks. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, um, <coughs> Cabinet Secretary, um, I, I'm concerned about the, the few tenant farmers who've achieved full 1991 tenancies who may now lose their security of tenure. And can you give any reassurance that every effort will be made to to allow them to carry on their secure tenancy. There's two um, farm families I know of where the sons have come back to farm because of um, what they thought was the situation. And, and it, you know, um, I wonder whether you will be able to safeguard the future of the tenant farmers whose lives and businesses are likely to be disrupted in the next year or so. Certainly, and we recognise that's a very real concern, so we are working hard on that. We don't want... Mm -hmm. Uh, well, we want to minimise disruption for uh, farmers affected uh, by this court judgment, and that is the objective. And we will be getting down to looking at each individual circumstance to see how we can, you know, uh, do our best to safeguard the interests of the farmers affected. So there's a team working in Scottish government on this. Uh, it's you know we're putting resource into it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as I said, we're going to look at each case on a case-by-case -case basis to see how we can minimise the disruption, if that is at all possible. But, of course, we do have the obligation to fix the law as well. Yeah, thank you. If there are, yeah, Alex Ferguson, yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a question on the timescale of this, because I think I'm right in saying that a draft order is meant to be laid by the end of November, unless the government applies for an extension, given we're already halfway through September, I assume... Perhaps wrongly, that an extension might be required. Can you give us any idea of the, the timescale that this is likely to take? As things stand, our timetable is to lay the draft order and start the public consultation, which requires, as you know, the 60 days uh, in late November. All right, okay. So that's still on the card. Yeah. Thank you. And we expect to have a briefing from you in our work programme around about that time about what your final proposals are in that. Uh, consultation sure. and order. Good. Right. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to change uh, office officials, um, bring in Drew Sloan for the next part uh, to deal with the common agriculture policy, which we can get an update from the cab sec on just in a moment. Try and uh, move straight on with this just now. Cabinet Secretary, you want to give us an update on uh, the Common Agriculture Policy uh, implementation? Uh, thank thank you. you very much. To move on from the very simple clear cut issue of tenancies in Scotland <laughs> to the equally clear cut and simple issue of the reform of the Common Agricultural Policy. Uh, with your patience, uh, Committee, I would be very grateful if I can just give you a few comments to bring you up to date, given it is a, a few months since we've had the opportunity due to summer recess uh, to give an update uh, as to where we've reached. <coughs> Clearly, my objective with the reform of the Common Agricultural Policy is to ensure that we can continue to support active, productive agriculture in Scotland, the ability of this nation to produce food, and, of course, meet our environmental obligations at the same time. And throughout the negotiations, the Scottish Government has been aiming for the new cap to be fairer and sufficiently flexible to meet Scotland's needs. It must also reward active farming and, of course, put an end to what we refer to as slipper farming. So now the cap reform is reaching the end of the negotiating phase, but there is still some way to go. Firstly, we need Europe to finish off the main cap uh, regulations. The agreements reached in June nearly achieved that, but there were some issues linked to the multi-annual financial framework that the European Parliament wouldn't agree to at that stage. And those issues include the flexibility to move funds between pillars and so-called degressivity, the system for reducing or capping big farm payments. So the new Lithuanian presidency is meeting uh, the European Parliament this week, and next week the presidency will report back to the Council of Ministers in Brussels, and I'll be there for that meeting. 
Hopefully the final deal should be voted on by the Parliament on the 18th and 19th of November and adopted by the Council soon after. There is a similar timetable for the transition regulation covering the cap in an interim year of 2014. So we are inching our way towards final European agreement on the main regulations by the end of the year. Now we urgently need the Commission to begin the negotiations of the detailed implementation rules, which are of course extremely important. And we need to finalise the carve-up of the UK's cap budget allocation. Unfortunately, of course, that's an area where the UK Government could have done much more for us here in Scotland. On Pillar 1 direct payments, Scotland is now third from the bottom, with only 48% of the EU average rate. And on Pillar 2, it looks like Scotland will again have the lowest allocation per hectare in the whole of Europe. By way of comparison, the Irish negotiated a €2 billion Euro allocation for Pillar 2 rural development alone. That's a country the size of Scotland securing the equivalent of 85% of the allocation of the whole of the UK. And other small nations achieved similar outcomes. Against that disappointing background, I am really determined to ensure that Scotland's farmers get a fair deal from the UK's cap allocation. And just last week, I wrote to Owen Patterson setting out Scotland's demand for a, a fairer share of the budget, including from the so-called external convergence mechanism. Now, if it wasn't for Scotland, the UK as a whole would be a net contributor under that mechanism rather than a beneficiary. So the only fair outcome is that the fuel convergence allocation around 11 million euros in 2014, rising to 60 million euros by 2019, must come to Scotland. In other words, if Scotland weren't part of the UK, the UK would not get that uplift. Therefore, the whole of the uplift should come to Scotland. So some important details about the new cap remain to be clarified. Nonetheless, we're already working hard on how to implement it. And today I'd like to highlight some of the key issues for implementation. One issue is how to divide Scotland into what's referred to as payment regions for the new cap. We've already done significant modelling with the James Huston Institute and worked with stakeholders to narrow down the options. In fact, Scottish farmers have probably been given more analysis and modelling than any other farmers in Europe. We won't take final decisions, however, until after a full public consultation, which will take place later this year. But based on the work so far, it seems to me that we should look at a maximum of two or three payment regions for Scotland. Another key issue is the move from historic to area-based payments. Here the options are to go immediately to area payments in day one, to move more slowly and phase in area payments by the 2019 scheme year, or to stop short of full area-based payments, which is referred to as the Irish Tunnel Model. Historic-based payments have served their purpose. So moving to area payments will remove the anomalies that completely exclude new entrants and deer farmers, for instance. But understandably, farmers who do well under the historic system are concerned about the impact on their businesses of moving so quickly to area payments. This point was made to me last week by a group of concerned beef producers I met. Although even in the beef sector, it's important to bear in mind moving to area pay payments will bring both winners and losers. On the whole, I'm attracted to moving to area payments by 2019. But at this stage, we also need to do more on the tunnel option uh, to understand how it could work in Scotland, to see how that would look uh, as a comparison to moving straight to area payments. One answer to the beef sector's concerns may, of course, lie in voluntary couple support. As you know, I find it very, very frustrating that we didn't secure a level playing field across the whole of Europe in that particular area. It's iniquitous that some countries can continue at a higher rate of couple payments, while Scotland has a lower limit, despite year after year of data showing a decline in our livestock numbers here in Scotland. In my letter to Owen Patterson on the budget, I have therefore sought clarity on the possibility of using the wider UK ceiling for couple support. Initially, we were told by the UK Farming Minister David Heath that that may be possible. Then Owen Patterson, when I was speaking to him a few months ago, ruled that out. So we're getting mixed messages from the UK government. But the latest position is that we can't use the UK ceiling, but I am seeking final clarity on that issue from the UK government. If we do have to live within the 8% of Scotland's allocation, one option would be to use that full amount for the beef sector. Some, some, some sheep set producers uh, would, of course, be disappointed to hear me say that. But there are mixed views even within the sheep sector, and many sheep farmers stand to gain anyway under the move to area payments. So, convener, there are just some of the, the key issues we have to think about when we think about direct payments and how to implement that in Scotland. There are, of course, other issues in how to implement greening, 
what minimum activity levels we should impose, what to do with big payments and what uh, we should give serious consideration to the arguments for and against capping individual payments. But in planning carefully for Pillar 1, we mustn't forget the importance of Pillar 2 uh, and the Scotland Rural Development Programme. <coughs> the SRDP supports priorities for rural communities, less favoured areas, new entrants, climate change, environment and food and drink, amongst other important issues for rural communities and industries. In the next programme, we'll have to be clever to get the balance of funding right within what's going to be a constrained budget. We've already been working with stakeholders for over 18 months on our plans for the next SRDP, and we had held our first cons consultation on these plans during the summer, and stakeholders generally supported their proposals so far. There will be a second consultation this autumn, and we'll give more detail about that as we move forward. At the heart of that has to be simplification and focus, simplification of the guidance and the whole approval process, and a clear focus on delivering our key priorities for Scotland. So the second consultation will close early next year. We then will have to submit the new programme to Brussels in spring 2014, with approval hopefully coming from Brussels by autumn 2014, although, as we know, these timescales are often up in the air. The European timetable has unfortunately made it impossible to avoid a gap between programmes in 2014. The Commission finally acknowledged that and have produced a draft transitional regulation, and as drafted, that will allow us to continue some key elements of the programme during the gap year to start using the new budgets. I know that stakeholders are keen to hear our full transitional plans, and we intend to make an announcement on that later uh, in the next week or two. I remain disappointed that the transitional regulation does not cover the whole programme, and I will continue to push for that next week. What I can say is that our transition plans will deliver vital continuity in priority areas such as LFAS, uh, agri-environment payments, and woodland creation. So it is timely to discuss the CAP reform today at this uh, committee meeting. The negotiating process is nearly over, uh, and of course we will have more consultations coming in both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 as well. And we have to notify Europe on, of, our, of our decision in Pillar 1 by the main deadline of August uh, next year. So we want to get the new SRDP up and running as soon as possible, uh, and we want to make sure that we minimise disruption through the gap year of 2014 as well. So there's a whole lot of issues I'm sure you want to discuss today as a committee, but I hope that gives you a quick outline of where we are at this important stage. I remind members that, of course, once we get a clearer picture of what you're going to be consulting on, that we'll be having further evidence from the Cabinet Secretary at that time. But uh, we certainly do want to try and uh, ask some initial questions, starting with Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask what the rationale is behind going for a maximum of two to three regions uh, and um, how the geographical way out of those might look? <clears throat> Clearly because Scotland is a diverse country and the kind of mechanism of support we want to deliver moving forward as we move from historic payments to area payments, which will lead to change, will be different in different parts of the country and different farming enterprises. So clearly the support that we may wish to decide to deliver to an upland farm in the island of Mull would be different to an intensive beef farm in North East Scotland or South West Scotland. Therefore, the flexibility in the CAP agreement allows us to have different levels of support mm. delivered to different parts of the country or different types of farming enterprises. So then we have to decide how do we want to use that flexibility. Now, we could have several payment regions or we could have one or two. Clearly, if we were to try and cater for every single circumstance in every Scottish farm and have lots of different payment rates and different payment regions, that would be unbelievably complex and would lead to all, un all kinds of unintended consequences. So we've been discussing with stakeholders how many payment regions we should have. And as I said in my opening remarks, we've narrowed that down to two or three. Because if we're moving to area payments, and clearly the payments that go on a historic basis at the moment to certain farms are going to be different to what they'll get under area payments, then we have to uh, work out to what extent we want the changes to take place, the transition period, and also we may wish to give different levels of payments to extensive farming compared to intensive farming. And that's why we want different payment regions. So we do want different payment regions. 
We're now having a debate as to how many we should have to cater for different circumstances. But at the moment, the consensus appears to be no more than three, but we need at least two. OK. Right. Alec Ferguson. So I was just really to a little bit of clarity on that, if I may, before I just come to the question I want to ask. Just to pick that up, to my full understanding, you're suggesting two to three, two or three geographic regions within which there will be varying rates for different types of farming. Is that, in a, in a nutshell, what you're looking at? Okay. Well, what I've addressed perhaps in the previous answer is the definition of payment region. So we have the options to make that geographical or by land quality oh, or right. whatever. So at the moment, what we're looking at and modelling is on um, existing criteria for land quality. Uh, therefore, we then avoid a situation of having a crude geographical split because even one part of Scotland will have within it a diverse range of, of land quality and farming types. So you could have a really good quality farm next to a poor quality farm. In well, in terms of land, I'm speaking about the farm. But you know, you could have good yeah. quality land next to poor quality land, even in certain parts of Scotland where you'd expect perhaps not to be too much good quality land. And it would be unfair to give the same rate of payment mm -hmm. to yeah. Yeah. farms with different land quality. So just looking at Scotland on the basis of land quality as opposed to geographical areas is what we're looking at just now. Yes. So the region there is almost certainly will not be a geographic area. It's more likely to be a land type. Yes, it's more likely. Right. Yes. Sorry. That, right. Yes, that's, Thank that's, you where, that. that's where we're going just now with the yeah, options. Yeah. That, that clarifies that. The question I wanted to ask was, I, th I think I heard you say that in the transitional arrangements, um, funding would still be in place for woodland creation. But my understanding was that woodland planting grants would not be able to be made um, over, over the period of transition. Can you clarify that for us? I'll bring David in, uh, who's involved in a minute-to-minute, hour-to-hour, day-to-day basis <laughs> on sorting out the transition uh, of the current rural development programme to the new rural development programme. But effectively, we're not allowed to fund under the transitional regulation capital projects, and that means the food grants and various other capital projects we're unable to plug for the transition year, but in terms of woodlands and help for new entrants and also the ELFAS scheme, we are trying to get into a position where we can continue those schemes throughout the gap year. But I'll ask David to come in on the specific point. OK, thank you. Yes, convener, Mr Ferguson's uh, quite right. This is, as the Cabinet Secretary says, one of the areas where the transition regulation leaves a gap. So uh, we will not be able to formally process and approve applications uh, during that gap. Oh. So the transition plan that uh, we've been working on, working very closely with uh, Forestry Commission Scotland colleagues uh, and the woodland sector themselves, is to make it feel to the practitioners on the ground as if there isn't a gap, despite there being a gap in strict legal terms. So the mechanisms for doing that will be firstly to um, accelerate the processing of uh, applications during these last months of the existing programme, because we can approve, uh, although the, the, uh, the current programme terminates at the end of 2013, we can, before the end of 2013, approve projects for which the work will take place uh, at later dates. So as we speak, the Forestry Commission are granting approvals for projects which will take place during the gap year. And the second thing that we can do, um, Forestry Commission Scotland colleagues are planning during the gap to, uh, on an informal basis, work on applications and work closely with the applicants so that they can bring their project, projects during the gap to the, the very brink of formal approval. And that way, once the new programme is approved and in place, they will be able to give the formal appro approvals uh, pretty much immediately. Uh, and the aim is that that will feel, so despite the existence in strict legal terms of a gap, the intention is that that will feel to the practitioners on the ground uh, as if there is no such gap. That's something that uh, we, we identified um, a year or more ago that there was some particular priority areas to, to keep continuity on um, in the forest sector. Obviously, nurseries are having to plan years ahead mm, for the, exactly. the supply of, uh, yeah. of uh, young trees. Um, and so for, for a long time now, Forestry Commission colleagues have been working with the industry on what the options are 
and that's the uh, the transition plan essentially that they've uh, that they've come up with. But, but the will, th sorry, thank you for that, and I, I, that all makes total sense. But there will presumably be some impact on the um, planting target for 2014 in terms of hectares being planted. The intention of uh, our forestry commission colleagues is to uh, minimise and, if at all possible, avoid any such impact. Diplomatically put, thank you very much. Uh, can I just probe it a bit from the point of view of uh, the time that it takes uh, to actually uh, put forward uh, an application and for it to go through the process anyway? This could perhaps last for more than a year in normal terms? Could it? Yes, there's a, there is a danger of the European timetable slipping. I mean, I outlined at the beginning some timescales that Europe have given us at the moment in terms of when we'd expect them to uh, give the go-ahead for the next rural development programme. But we know from bitter experience that last time around, just after I came into office, there was a significant delay from Europe in, in giving the go-ahead to, to Scotland's programme. So we hope that they'll stick to their timetable and avoid that delay. But yes, by the time the new scheme opens and then the applications go in, and then the applications are either successful or not, and then the payments are made, you are talking about opening up um, in you know, 2014, 2015, so the year gap will be longer than a year in that context. I was thinking about your experience in the current SRDP, uh, when people put forward projects for approval. Um, what I meant initially, although that's, that's very welcome to know, that the application process can take quite a number of months, perhaps even over a year. So in actual fact, any suggestion that this affects business, uh, rural business confidence is misplaced. That in fact, uh, people who are making applications of this sort know, take it, it knows that it, know that they take quite a number of months in order to achieve anyway. Is it the case that some of these applications, in any case, will take over a year from application to approval? Well, I think it's worth bearing in mind that we introduced a continuous application process mm -hmm. in the existing SRDP mm -hmm. to avoid big delays. I think I'm right in saying for forestry in particular. And that as part of the new rural development programme, we're looking at whether we can extend that continuous application process to other schemes, depending on what schemes we, sh we choose to include within the programme. So we're trying to avoid long delays in the application process. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much. Other members have any questions on this at the moment? Dick uh, Lyle. Can I re-emphasise or, or can you again explain or give me some figures? You said that Scotland is third bottom in pillar one, lowest in pillar two. How much money are we going to lose and how much money would we actually have extra if this country was independent? <clears throat> well, it's an important question because, uh, you know, we're one year away from the referendum on independence. And if you're a member state within Europe, you have many more advantages than being a, a sub-nation within a bigger member state, uh, as we currently are at the moment. Um, there's a formula adopted as part of the current cap reform for member states to calculate the level of support they get through the cap budget. And Europe decided to raise those countries who get way below the average of existing payments to get them to 196 euros per hectare by 2019. But that formula only applies to member states. So whereas Scotland is way below the average at the moment, and had we been a member state, we'd qualify for up to a billion extra euros by 2019 on top of our single pound payment just now. <coughs> we will not get that because it's the UK figure that's taken into account, not Scotland's, because we're not a member state. Uh, however, that will deliver a small uplift to the whole of the UK, and as I said in my opening remarks, we therefore think because we're 
ensuring the UK qualify for uplift, it should all come to Scotland. But at the moment, we get a pitiful low allocation of single farm payments. Uh, we're a large rural country, we've got many farming enterprises, uh, and we uh, face additional challenges given our, our climate and topography, and therefore uh, we deserve a much greater share of the CAP budget, but we're not getting it because we're not a member state. Uh, and as you said, uh, you know, we are one of the lowest uh, ranking countries in the whole of Europe at the moment, if you were to take Scotland's average. And if we, you know, if we, if we take Scotland's average at the moment and just say we were a member state, under the current figures, we'd be fourth lowest in the whole of Europe. Um, I spoke to the Baltic states <coughs> uh, a few months ago, and the Baltic states explained to me that they were working together to improve their, their allocations. So, whilst we've not seen the final league table yet under the new cap, it may well be that not only do, did we go in with the lowest Pillar 2 allocation in the whole of Europe and the fourth lowest Pillar 1 allocation in the whole of Europe, but if the Baltic states have managed to get a good deal, they'll leapfrog us in the league table and we'll come out of an even worse position in the league tables in Europe. So, the UK's decision not to lift a finger to get a better budget for Scotland, despite the unfairness and injustice of the current situation, it will cost us dear. And many of our farmers dear. Well, this is about the future of our farming businesses, not just that in terms of Pillar 2 funding, of course. It's about the wider rural economy and village halls, renewable energy schemes, environment schemes, new entrance schemes, uh, woodland creation, uh, and so on. We will lose hundreds of millions of euros by not getting an uplift in the Pillar 2 allocation notwithstanding the billion euros we're losing by not getting an uplift in the Pillar 1 allocation. And other countries actually negotiated a greater Pillar 2 uplift. 16 out of the 27 member states negotiated a special uplift in their Pillar 2 allocations. So they were already way ahead of Scotland in the league table, but negotiated a further uplift just by getting in behind closed doors with the European Commission and negotiating it. We didn't even negotiate a fairer share of the existing Pillar 2 allocation, never mind an extra uplift. Uh, so they're even further ahead of Scotland. Um, and as I said in my opening remarks, the Irish, for instance, negotiated an uplift in their Pillar 2 allocations. And they will be receiving, you know, what, 85% of what the whole of the UK gets. Thank you. So other agricultural ministers are sitting down across Europe working out what to do with the actual resource they're getting in and which sector should benefit and have that investment. I, here in Scotland, are discussing how to deal with real-term real -term cuts. And that's uh, real businesses, real jobs that we're losing out on. Thank you. Um, Jim Hume. Yes, sure, thanks. Um, I was just interested in the, the, the two transition models that seem to be in play. One, transitioning uh, from uh, historic to uh, geographical by 2019, and the other one, as, as you referred to, is the, the, the Irish Tunnel. Uh, I would just like if you could expand on how you would foresee that, how that would look in, in Scotland. I mean, would that be a gradual change to 2019, or would it be a sudden change at 2019, and also what, what your views are on the, the Irish Tunnel model, as you referred to? Well, what I've said all along in the CAP negotiations is that the pace of transition and the end point of the transition we want to get to in 2019 will be determined to what extent those that are currently frozen out under the historic system are fully integrated to the new CAP system, i.e. new entrants. So clearly they don't benefit from historic payments and many of them don't get any payments whatsoever. And we want to bring them up to a level playing field as quickly as possible with existing active farmers. So what we're doing is calculating where new entrants will sit under each of the different scenarios. And we were successful in negotiating the ability to bring new entrants onto a level playing field. But what I have to understand uh, uh, properly is if that's compromised by decisions of the transition to 2019. So if we don't move to a pure historic, uh, sorry, if we don't move to a pure area basis by 2019, uh, and there's a historic element left within the system, mm -hmm. will that therefore mean there's less resource under area payments to help the new entrants? But if I want them to have a level playing field, that may influence to what extent I go down the Irish Tunnel route. Thank you. 
Okay. Okay. If uh, that makes sense. Yeah. No. No. It, it does so make sense. It's obviously very, very complicated, but I'm just trying to explain how going down one direction may have implications for another one of your objectives. Mm -hmm. but th 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 it does make sense, though. <laughs> quite happy with that. But just to, just to follow that up, I mean, have you looked at or thought about national reserve and keeping a national reserve open during every year of off cap? And is that something that's still in the in the melting pot? Yes, we will be implementing the National Reserve mm -hmm. because that is the route to help new entrants uh, in terms of future new entrants. And we, as you know, put a lot of effort into negotiating the ability to use the National Reserve and make sure that was available for Scotland so we don't have a repeat of what we had in this common agricultural policy, which is new entrants being frozen out. We want to make sure there's the ability to help ensure that anyone who's genuinely active in agriculture producing goods for the nation they get the relevant support from the common agricultural policy. And just to be clear, because there's, you can either implement a national reserve at the beginning and then it, it's closed and that's, and that's that, but are you talking more about a national reserve that would be open throughout every year of, of CAP? Yeah, I'll ask David perhaps just to address the technicalities uh -huh. of the national reserve because we sought to ensure that not only was it available to help new entrants be part of the new CAP, also future new entrants, exactly. there's an ability to make that's sure they were part of the new cap as well. Point, yeah. David, do you want to just refer to the, the technical aspects of how that will work? Yes, the original uh, vision from the European Commission was indeed that the uh, National Reserve would be a one-off exercise at the start of the process mm -hmm. and, uh, and would not be needed subsequently. Uh, to, be, to be fair to the Commission, their expectation was that across most of Europe, all or virtually all the land likely to be eligible would uh, come into the system on day one and receive allocations and therefore the scenario in which a new entrant would get access to a farm, get access to land but not get access to the entitlements with it, uh, the Commission didn't envisage that happening because the outgoing farmer would have no incentive to hang on to the entitlements. It was for that reason that uh, the Commission envisaged there wouldn't be a need for an ongoing National Reserve. Um, but Scotland and, and one or two other member states um, made it clear to the Commission that uh, in some parts of Europe there will be more land uh, than is given entitlements uh, on day one. And therefore, the scenario where a future new entrant could get access to land but not automatically get entitlements to go with it, that is a real scenario uh, in Scotland and yeah. some other parts of Europe and therefore yes we negotiated for and achieved the insertion of some wording that will allow us uh, after the one-off National Reserve exercise at the beginning mm -hmm. it will allow us to do repeated okay. top small top slices if necessary if the reserve is exhausted if necessary to then create entitlements on an ongoing basis uh, for new entrants right up to 2020. Good I think that'll be very useful thank you. So that could play into um, the idea that more land could be let by landowners and therefore potentially new entrants could come into these and get some entitlement. It will certainly help the <coughs> financial viability of new entrants in the future. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Claudia Beamish now. Um, Cabinet Secretary, could I just take you back to the points you're making about the allocation within the UK um, for, for this round of um, cap. And uh, when uh, Owen Patterson came before us, I was quite concerned that he was highlighting that he was being approached by farmers and NFU and, and different groups from throughout the UK saying this would be a fair allocation. Um, and he had a lot to weigh up, which of course he does. But it, seems, it seemed to me then, it still seems to me that in view of what you've highlighted today, that Scotland has a really strong factual case um, within this round, and I wonder to what degree you're able to tell us that you're hopefully making some progress with that, with, um, with Owen Paterson. Well, in my view, the least we can expect from the current negotiation is the Secure securing of 100% of the UK's uplift in CAP funding, mm -hmm. which, as I said before, the UK only qualifies for because of Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be a travesty of justice if 
that were not to be the case. There is, of course, a wider debate about the fact that we're starting from such a low share of the cap budget in Scotland that you know, we'd welcome any more support the UK is willing to offer to, to bring us up closer to the European average. Mm -hmm. um, after all, if Europe's taken a decision, which the UK signed up to, that payments in, in countries should be up to €196 Euros by 2019-2020, why should that not apply to Scotland? And what's the UK going to do to deliver that? Mm -hmm. uh, and that would require a lot more than the the UK's uplift coming to Scotland, that require a whole renegotiation of the, uh, the baseline budget within the UK. Uh, clearly, I'm not particularly optimistic that that's going to be Owen Patterson's approach, so I expect the, the negotiations will be around getting the, the UK's uplift of up to 60 million euros by 2019-2020 to come to Scotland. Mm. I have to say that Owen Patterson's tactics have been pretty outrageous so far. Uh, we have the ludicrous situation where he's invented new formula to justify not giving Scotland the UK's uplift. So we have this uh, situation where the, U the European Union has decided a formula to allocate member state allocations. So that's how the UK got its allocation in the first place. But Owen Patterson is suggesting that he may support a different formula when it comes to distributing the funding within the UK to move the goalposts mm -hmm. to justify Scotland not getting the uplift, which uh, we allowed the UK to qualify for in the first place. Now, clearly, that's a negotiation that's going on just now, and I, I think you've uh, no doubt come across Owen Patterson making those arguments in public, that uh, under different formulas, mm -hmm. there's different figures of what farms get across Scotland and the rest of the UK, mm. uh, not, notwithstanding the fact that he's including horse paddocks in the, in the mm -hmm. uh, English statistics to, to bring down the average of uh, farm payments in England. And we don't include that in our farm payments in Scotland, therefore our average is higher. Uh, so there's all kinds of tactics going on behind the scenes, as you can imagine, but he has referred to them publicly as well. So I think we've got a very robust case to, at the very least, secure the additional uh, 60 million euros that will be coming to the UK per year by 2019. Uh, albeit, of course, if the vote goes the right way next year, we won't have to bother uh, with payments beyond 2016 from the UK, because we'll be getting our own allocation, which hopefully will be much higher. Uh, but the, uh, in the short term, between now and 2016, we deserve that uplift. It, it belongs to Scotland, it should come to Scotland. Um, and uh, the UK government should not be allowed to steal it. Right, Gavina, could I, I've, I've got a, another brief question. Um, yeah, I, I, I was actually asking specifically about this, this round, you know, uh, and in relation to Owen Patterson, just for the record. Yes. But, but anyway, that's just a, um, before I, I ask my other question, which is actually about the, um, the, I believe it's called modulation, if I got it correct, from pillar one to pillar two. And um, just uh, being an advocate myself of, of uh, which I understand you might be as well, but I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, um, of, of as much of the 15% being used um, in that transfer. Uh, in view of the fact that there are a lot of rural businesses and uh, the wider issues around um, landscape and support for communities doing um, a, a whole range of projects, um, that you could reassure us that, that that might be your position about that transfer? <coughs> Clearly, because of our pitiful low Pillar 2 allocation for rural development funding, uh, we will be transferring from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2. Uh, clearly, there's no case for transferring from Pillar 2 to Pillar 1, mm -hmm. as I said before, because of the yeah. poor allocation of Pillar 2 in the first place. Uh, and the debate we'll have and consult upon as to what extent we should be transferring from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2. And again, that debate will be influenced by whether or not we secure the uplift that we want uh, from the UK, mm -hmm. because that will influence the Pillar 1 budget. So we have to iron out that budget negotiation with the UK before we can take final decisions as to what extent we'll transfer from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2. Right. right. And, Camille, I've got a very brief question just about individual farms and the capping process. I wondered, Cabinet Secretary, if you know, if you're able to tell us how many farms that would affect um, if we did go down the road if, of, the, of the capping of payments to individual farms. Right, in terms of capping of the payments, yeah. <coughs> Well, what I've said is I've got an open mind on capping the payments at the moment. We're still waiting for the final 
rules to be agreed by Europe in terms of what's mandatory, what's voluntary, mm -hmm. what the, the scales would be, um, and therefore, you know, we're, we're still some way away from taking a final decision. And again, I'd want to take into account how easy it would be to implement a capping policy, uh, because you know it could be horrendously bureaucratic, uh, you know, to, to implement. So we have to understand that as well. Uh, So, how many farms are affected at individual farm level clearly would be at what yes. stage you chose to implement it. Okay. Uh, but the position on the, the table at the moment uh, from the, I think it's the European Parliament and the European Commission, is to have decrescivity, which is the reduction of payments over a certain amount of payments. Uh, and we're just waiting to understand what the final percentages might be of that, and if it is indeed mandatory. Uh, however, under most of the capping scenarios we've looked at, uh, very few farms would mm -hmm. be affected in Scotland, albeit uh, it could still raise a few million pounds to transfer into Pillar 2. So that's why I've not ruled it out at the moment. Thank you. Okay, well, I uh, don't think there's other questions at the moment. We've uh, got a good uh, update on where we are, and uh, it's been a, a fairly long session just now. But I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and his teams for a stimulating and uh, uh, useful uh, set of answers. The dynamics of what happens next have been made very clear today, and I think we'll want to keep a very close look on these uh, and get you back for another update as soon as we're... Uh, getting some clarity about the negotiations within Britain and the clarification of the rules from Europe. So thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, for this very welcome visit to our committee. Uh, we'll have a short break of five minutes before we get into the next session. Thank you.
Uh, ladies, and we'll come to order, please, for agenda item three on the Rasse Sporting uh, Rights Lease. Um, final item on the agenda today is evidence session with uh, the Minister. Uh, welcome, uh, Paul Wheelhouse, uh, with uh, Drew Sloan as Chief Agricultural Officer and Jonathan Price, Director of Agriculture, Food and Rural Communities in the Scottish Government. Do you wish to make uh, an initial statement, Minister? I, I would, Convener. Thank you. It will be important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would I'd certainly like to thank the committee for inviting me today uh, to give an update on the situation relating to the sporting rights on Rassi. Uh, going back to the very start, as you know, a mistake was made um, earlier this year to assign the sporting rights on Rassi to the highest bidder without sufficient consideration of the uh, wider implications for the community on Rassi something that, that would have potentially been avoided had ministers been consulted prior to the decision to tender or to award the lease to a successful bidder. The decision to re-let the sporting rights on Rassi was driven by the expiry of the existing lease. Uh, while initially sporting rights were originally leased to a private landowner, uh, the lease was subsequently assigned to the Highlands and Islands Development Board in November 1981 for the remaining period of 31 years and then reassigned to the RCA in 1995 and ultimately was due to expire in November 2012. On the 1st of November 2011, anticipating the end of the original lease, the Scottish Government Rural Payments Inspectorate Division, uh, or ARPID, uh, wrote to the RCA giving it notice that the lease would come to an end. The normal practice when tendering for assets held by Scottish ministers is that officials will advertise, assess and award bids in line with value for money principles as laid out in the Scottish Public Finance Manual. In line with this practice, uh, the lease was advertised in the open market during weeks commencing 19th and 26th of November 2012, with advertisements being placed in the West Highland Free Press and the Shooting Times. Uh, a closing date for bids was set for the 14th of December 2012, and there were five offers submitted by the closing date. Unfortunately, the lowest offer was, as was reported at the time following the decision uh, from the RCA itself. Two of the other offers received, bidding a higher amount than the RCA, originated from the Isle of Skye, and South Ayrshire Stockings offer was accepted uh, by civil servants on the basis that it was the highest offer for the sporting rights and in line with the Scottish Public Finance Manual value for best value principles. Um, but without giving uh, sufficient weight, clearly, to the wider community benefits and without consultation with Scottish ministers. When the issue was, regrettably, first raised with me by the local MSP, uh, Dave Thompson, and subsequently by regional MSPs and the local MP, uh, reflecting the concerns expressed by the RCA, I took immediate action to help resolve the situation. Initially, uh, we explored the opportunity to modify the terms of the lease, to maximise the community engagement uh, in the operation of the lease, to mitigate the loss of sporting rights to RCA itself. And when it became clear this would be insufficient to address community concerns, discussions entered uh, a new phase. As the First Minister announced during First Minister's questions on 28th of February, having fully considered the impacts of the RCA losing the lease, we had successfully negotiated with South Ayrshire Stockings voluntary exit of the contract. The cost of the Scottish Government was £9,000, which covered costs incurred by South Ayrshire Stocking, and I should stress these were only part of those already incurred. Uh, and my thanks go to Chris Dalton and South Ayrshire Stocking for their understanding and agreement to withdraw from the contract. As I said at the time, from the perspective of Mr Dalton, he won the lease fairly, and therefore he acted very honourably in withdrawing from the lease when he realised the upset caused to the community of Rassi. Additionally, and as, with a, uh, as a result of representations made, ministers will now be involved in a manner consistent with the Scottish Finance Manual on any decision where this would result in a local community failing to secure a lease when they have been until the time of renewal with tenants. Uh, I met with RCA and, and the community on RASI on the 1st of March and we discussed the background uh, to the original decision and possible approaches to address the problem. Given the need to demonstrate a justification for varying from normal best value approaches and in order to make decisions about the future of RASI sporting rights and, of course, to allow the views of the community to be heard and considered in making of these decisions, a consultation was launched on 24th of April and ran until 7th of June. Three options were presented to the community, namely a long-term lease of up to uh, 175 years granted to a local community group, which uh, could be direct with the RCA or another community group, which could also involve uh, the RCA. 
The lease, uh, the second option was the lease being put on the open market with the winning bidder needing to demonstrate optimal community benefit. Or the third option would have been a right to buy being exercised over the land itself, which would include rights over the lease. A buyout of the sporting rights uh, only, which had been uh, proposed by some, is, only imp is, is impossible under Scots law, so we could not consider that as an option on this occasion. We received 74 responses to the consultation, or a response rate of 51%. Uh, the responses showed that there were various and divergent views on the solution and way forward, with no clear majority in favour of any of the three options, although the option to let the lease to the RCA was recognised as the lead preference of the community. The options of the lease being extended on a long-term let and that of a community buyout were only supported by a small number of respondents. A key theme running through the consultation responses was a greater need for transparency and community benefit than had been delivered under the existing lease. <clears throat> to that end, I will ensure that the community benefits are delivered to assist this fragile community. These benefits could include local employment, supply of venison, both butchered and packed in the island, uh, greater promotion of tourism through the sporting rights, making better use of the fishing rights and greater community involvement and support of local businesses. I will also ensure proper transparency of the operation and finances of the sporting rights to make sure lease costs and community benefit are clear and sustainable. Therefore, and on the basis of the views outlined in the consultation responses, I have decided that the lease should be offered to the RCA for a period of five years. As a lease is being offered to the RCA without competition, we will be required to demonstrate value for money in line with the Scottish Public Finance Manual. My aim is that this needs to demonstrate economy, efficiency and effectiveness, as well as value for money to the taxpayer, and that this will be provided through the community benefit that will be delivered as part of a condition of the lease to such a fragile economy. Subject to the conditions being met, there will be the option for a further automatic renewal uh, of five more years. We will, of course, negotiate the fine detail of these proposals with the RCA, and my officials will be meeting with its members soon to discuss the way forward. Convener, I'm very much aware that RACI is a fragile island community and fully recognise the importance of the sporting rights to the islanders. I aim to work closely with the RCA and the wider RACI community to ensure that the best solution and the best way forward for everyone is achieved. I believe the proposed approach offers a good solution and it respects the wishes of the majority of the community respondents that RCA should have the sporting rights, but also ensures that the opportunity to maximise the community benefit for the island and its economy is, is maximised. Thank you very much, Convener. I thank the Minister for, for that statement. Um, I'm just sorry that the local member can't be present because he's not well at the moment, but I'm sure he would have been to welcome uh, your decision to put the community at the heart of this. Um, I'd just like to ask you roughly if you have any idea about what <coughs> the value to the community is in terms of the income uh, and the balance sheet uh, year on year of this lease. Um, well, clearly, I, I, I imagine that from the community's point of view, based on the existing activity, that they've priced that into their, yeah. their original bid, which was the lowest of the five bids, as I say, and, and uh, some way off what uh, South Ayrshire Stocking had offered. We're still talking very small amounts in the case of uh, South Ayrshire Stocking, clearly, as well. But, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not necessarily been run on a basis to maximise the, the economic return to the island, uh, and therefore uh, the values to, to the community were not, and the Rassi Crofters Association were not necessarily high. But I don't know whether Jonathan, uh, if I may invite the convener, Certainly. Jonathan Price, to, to, to address that issue. I, I don't think we have any more detailed information on the, uh, on the accounts, for example, of the, of the, of the Crofters Association. So uh, what the minister said in terms of taking account of um, what the community was, what the, the Cooperative Association was prepared to offer, um, I think is a fair way to, way to make that assessment. It would be worth saying, Convener, as well, that one of the reasons why um, we're looking at trying to change the terms of the lease is to have greater transparency and understanding of how the, the lease can benefit the economy, uh, and that will give confidence, I think, to, to everyone involved that that, that is uh, being maximised to the opportunity to the island. Um, you talk about uh, making arrangements with them about economy efficiency and effectiveness. Does this include training, uh, the offer of training uh, in particular for local people? Yes, indeed, convener. I mean, we, we have an objective to ensure that the uh, well, all, all sporting rights that are, that are leased by, by Scottish Government um, do have a requirement that uh, those taking out those leases move to, to train staff and deer uh, stocking certificates. And our proposal in this case is to give communities sufficient time to allow them to train um, the members of the community up to DSC level two, which is a sort of advanced level 
um, uh, qualification for, for deer management to demonstrate good practice and to ensure that the conservation interests in terms of managing the sporting rights in Ireland are well, well looked after. This is a slight uh, um, you know, divergence from that, but it is sporting rights and it is uh, shooting and fishing rights. Has there ever been any discussion about the development of fishing rights on the island? In, in, in you're right to raise that issue, Convener. It's one of the issues in terms of the community benefit. We, we feel there might be better scope for, uh, for, for looking after the fishing rights on Rassi, and that's one area that we'll discuss with the community about how best we can maximise uh, the return to the island of uh, sustainable management of, of the fishing rights on, on Rassi. Okay, well, there's a number of other questions to ask. Uh, Richard Lyle, first of all. Uh, good morning, Minister. Can I... Uh, Welcome the comments you've just made, and can, out of curiosity, could, could you tell me what the, since I'm not from that area, I'm quite, my region's quite a bit away from that, that area, what was the highest and lowest bid originally? Uh, well, the South Air Stocking, if we've got the figures to hand, um, South Air for Stocking, £3,000 for the police, and the lowest was RCA, about £1,000. About £1,000. They had, yeah. up until the point where the, 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 the lease ended, Operated at six hundred and fifty pounds uh, rent per year for the for the sporting rights. So South uh, RCA had increased their offer up to a thousand, but clearly South Ayrshire Stockings bid was was much higher. Um, I think it was eleven hundred. Can, can I come in? Yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah, just if, if it's for the record, the, the bid was eleven hundred and fifty pounds. I was rounding it. Um, uh, I think it's uh, uh, thanks for that. Um, I'm surprised that actually we've only decided to uh, give them an extent, you know, a five-year lease. Uh, I know from previous uh, experience uh, where um, you know, companies are, are were looking at local organisations to give them a lease that, uh, in order to really ferment uh, um, uh, goodwill that the, the lease be longer. I know you have already said that this automatically or, or could be automatically extended yeah. uh, uh, after that period, but why did we just decide on five years? Well, uh, I think the first thing to say, our, our indication we'd had was that there wasn't a desire for anything longer than, than 10 years at this stage. Um, so, so taking it from that point of view, that we had discussed the potential of up to 170 uh, years at uh, least uh, with the community, but that hadn't been um, something that had been a strong support for. So narrowing it down to sort of a 10-year lease, because of the particular concerns there were to ensure transparency, community benefit had been demonstrated, um, we felt it would be of value to... Uh, we're all planning to have sort of a regular uh, meeting with, with the RCA in terms of discussing what's happened in the previous year to sort of update on what's happened in terms of community benefit management of the deer, uh, stocking, fishing rights and other issues uh, to, to, to update ourselves, if you like, that the, the terms of the lease are being delivered. This is putting a, an automatic kind of break clause, I suppose, in a sense there, so that if things aren't working well, and we've no reason to believe there will be a problem because uh, the, the community and through the RCA on, on the island have been managing the state broadly broadly on a satisfactory basis for some time now. So we fully anticipate with training going into DSC level two, that the, 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 um, the sporting rights will be managed in a very sustainable way. And I don't anticipate any problem, but it's, it's, it's putting that in there to protect the public interest, protect the community interest, because there were concerns raised about ensuring transparency and community benefit were demonstrated better than they have been in the past. Um, but I have uh, I've discussed um, uh, the, the proposal with, with Anne Gillies today and, and just explain this to her that you know, we don't anticipate a problem but it does give the, the option for an automatic extension to 10 years which we understand is the length that the, the, the RCA were looking for yeah. ideally. And my last question is, is basically I, I, I realise the decision was taken by an official uh, without your knowledge. Uh, I know that some decisions in, in other places are, are uh, delegated. I take it now that this type of decision is not delegated and will automatically come to min in front of ministers on each and every occasion. Well, you're quite right. I mean, uh, the, the history of this one, and it's worth stating that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, we've, we've explored as far back as we can in terms of the knowledge of people who are currently working in Scottish Government, um, and that's about 11 years of senior managers and about 30 years of those on the admin side, and there's never been an example where it's gone to a minister for a decision. So it's worth putting that on the record, that this is established practice under previous administrations, which we have carried forward. What we are going to do um, to address your, your point, Mr Lyle, is, is to make sure that in any circumstance where a community is at risk of losing their sporting rights, that ministers will always be involved at some point in the process. Now, we have to do that in a way that's consistent with the public finance manual, which means probably not me taking the actual decision, but what I can be involved with is, is steering the criteria on which the tender is offered, if there is a tender. And clearly, our intention would be, and this applies 
also to Rassie Crofters uh, at the end of the 10 years, assuming that they take up the offer of the lease that we have, we are, we're offering to them, uh, will be uh, a situation where if a, a notice to quit is, is served, as is normal for any lease that the government offers, that we would enter into discussions with the Rassi Crofters at, or Alternative Crofters or, or community and other, and other locations uh, as to their intention as to whether they want to continue the lease and uh, to discuss what sort of criteria uh, we might put into any subsequent contract. So we're definitely changing the procedures. We recognise there was an issue here that insufficient consideration was given to the community and wider community interest. And so we rectified that by will involve Scottish ministers in a way that's consistent with the public finance manual. So there's, you know, there's probity from my point of view and my successor's point of view, but also that we can we can have an input to the decision. Thank you. Uh, Jim Hume. Uh, uh, yes, thanks, Convenant. Uh, I think the Rassie Crofters Association will be very happy with your intervention, and, uh, and uh, I think it, I think you were quite right to uh, recognise uh, Theatre Stocking's uh, positive co uh, conversations with yourself to come to where... Yeah, come to where we've got to now, but uh, just sort of qu quite closely to Richard Lyle's point. I mean, you, you mentioned that it, officials uh, made decisions without ref referring to the ministers. Of, of course, being the captain of the ship, uh, you, you're responsible for the crew, and it, I think it's even against code of conduct of a minister to to, to blame officials. So it's a, a very uh, thin line there. I just wondered uh, what sort of areas. Do you think that we should ex expand this to uh, about due uh, diligence, uh, make, making sure that decisions that are made under your responsibility, albeit maybe uh, as you've admitted without y y your knowledge, are, are uh, secured so we don't have sort of similar situations, not perhaps just with sporting rights, but perhaps with other areas that uh, decisions are being made without your knowledge under your governance? Well, certainly the, f the first point, um, clearly... Uh, you know, we've got to avoid finger pointing and, 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 and blame making. I, I'm not keen to do that anyway, and uh, you're quite right, Mr. Hume. It's not appropriate for me to do that. No. Um, where we are is in a situation where um, we want to learn from what happened and make sure, as best possible, we can prevent a similar situation arising. So we certainly targeted it, the, an approach at similar situations that would arise within this portfolio, and we've done everything we can, I think, to to address the procedures to ensure that doesn't happen again. But it is a fair point, it's a fair question, you know, what else do we do? And uh, I know certainly within, you know, colleagues within, within RP, uh, we've got Jonathan, and, uh, Jonathan Price and Drew Sloan here with me today, have kind of been looking at implications there. But we, in taking, forming, uh, forming a, a sort of solution, if you like, to the particular problem that's arrived in Rassi, we have to take account of um, implications for ending other tenancies, other l l lets, you know, elsewhere within mm -hmm. Scottish Government estates. And so, hence, we have to do something that's in cons consistent with the public finance manual, and um, you would expect nothing less than that from, from me, I, I guess, as, as a minister. So, um, I think there's a legitimate point, and maybe we can come back to the committee about what we're doing widely, but I don't know whether Jonathan or Drew want to comment about the implications there might be for other parts of the, the ARPID estate and uh, portfolio. I think what I would say is that the um, we, we've very, very, very carefully made sure we get the message out to staff within the directorate, uh, including all the area office staff that, that, that work in the um, agricultural areas, that community interests are very much um, top, of the, top of the minister's agenda. So I think you can be, you can be pretty well assured that um, issues of this kind of nature uh, will certainly be escalated and the ministers will not be, um, you know, w will be involved, even if it's just for information. Um, just mm -hmm. to make sure that, that, that they are aware, are aware in the future. That's useful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yep. Jane Baxter. Yes. Convener. Um, just in, in line with um, what guidance officials or indeed ministers use when they're taking decisions, it's my understanding that um, there's an estate charter that dates back to 1999, and which is quite a long time ago. Um, and I don't know how these things are... are, are kept up to date or kept in people's minds. I don't know if there's a checklist of documents that are referred to when decisions are getting taken, but that estate charter um, has a commitment to take account of local community perspective considering offers for sporting rights on the Scottish Minister's estates. So that to me was very interesting. It's just to, as a point of information, refer uh, re the, re the relevant people to that charter. Maybe there's some wording or, or, or principles in there that can be brought to bear on future decisions. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, 
it's certainly, certainly a fair point that, that, uh, that Jane Baxter raises. Uh, you know, the seventh commitment in the, the state's charter, you know, does make clear um, that that um, the community interest should be taken into account in terms mm -hmm. of sporting rights. And hopefully, what we have now done uh, in regards to uh, this particular case and any subsequent sporting rights that come up where there's a community interest involved will address that formally now. So we kind of, uh, but it's a fair point to raise that. And to you, that state's charter was there. Um, is standard practice for the principles behind this state's charter to be taken into account when managing uh, the Scottish Minister's estate alongside other Scottish Government policies and requirements of the Scottish uh, Public Finance Manual? Just in this case, it appears not to have happened sufficiently, to have had sufficient weight, I suppose, in the, in the ultimate decision. But we have, um, as I say, recognised it was um, something that the benefit of hindsight was was not correct, and we've we've tried to put it right since. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, formally, anyway, <laughs> could could I um, ask you about how that charter, um, the I think it's 1999, so it's been there for quite a long time with its yeah. ten points. How that relates to the um, public finance manual in terms of the Scottish. Um, your responsibility as a minister for for those estates that that lie within that uh, within your remit. Um, how how do the two relate together? Because um, the public service manual, as I understand, uh, there is an expectation that it should be through best value. But Indeed. I understand that best value does also include the dreaded sustainable development as well. So I'm wondering how the two relate together. And in terms of protocols now. Um, from lessons learned, which you've mm -hmm. acknowledged, and, and I think there's a record. I, I, I can't sort of formally thank you in any way for that, but you know, we, we are moving forward. I wonder how those two fit together in terms of your responsibility. Well, well uh, Claudia Beamish is absolutely right. I mean, it's a, there's an issue here in terms of um, what the public finance manual states, which is, as you quite rightly identified, yes, there's sustainable development, but also mm -hmm. best, best value. Um, I suppose where we can interact, where we can get the two things to interact is where if, as I stated earlier, if ministers are involved or at least there's a guidance issued as regards similar situations that, that ministers are involved in setting the criteria on which the tender is issued to make it explicit that all mm -hmm. bids have to demonstrate community benefit. Mm -hmm. You're then assessing best value on the basis of the tender criteria that have been established. Yeah. And so your best value principles still apply, but the but the, the, the criteria that have been set for the tender are then established um, prior to the tendering exercise and everyone's treated fairly and so everyone's got an opportunity to bid on the basis of the expectation they're going to be asked to answer to what community benefit they're going to deliver in, the, in their tender. So I think that's probably the way in which we can bridge the gap because there is a bit of a gap, I think, between the two. Um, but clearly, uh, as, as I've outlined, in managing the estates, we do take into account the estates charter, but just in this particular example, there's a bit of a disconnect in terms of the ultimate result. And so we're trying to ensure that procedures address that. And in mm -hmm. future, um, as I say, in a manner consistent with the public finance, so I feel, finance manual, I feel I could be involved in, or uh, other ministers, sub successors, can be involved in, in setting the, the tender criteria where they feel there's, you know, it's important to demonstrate community benefit and to have a level playing field, if you like, uh, for that. So um, w would you think, Minister, that it might be helpful at this stage for there to be some sort of clear guidance which is publicly available that, that could be looked at in relation to how the charter works with the, um, with the um, public finance manual? Well, certainly, I mean, internally we, we have um, explained, I think, to, uh, to staff involved, I'd sort of take, take two things separately, so explain to staff yeah. involved that there is yeah. scope for flexibility within the finance manual, that there is room for uh, adapting tender cr criteria and as long as from that point on everyone has an equal chance in terms of the tender exercise and you're, you're demonstrating best value, it's a fair and open competitive tendering process based on the criteria that have been set. Um, I'm certainly willing to look at what issue we can, what we can do in terms of making that more explicit so people understand, but certainly on a tender by tender basis that would be the case. But I don't know if Jonathan have any advice about what we can do um, to, to have a general overarching, if you like, guidance on that issue. Uh, what, what I was going to draw attention to is the fact that the definition of best value in the public finance manual is, um, it s speaks about maintaining an appropriate balance between quality and cost. And essentially, I would see the estates charter as being your definition of quality um, in, in this kind of transaction. 
um, and, and, and I say that it was, it was that that wasn't given sufficient uh, um, credence at the, at the time of this decision. So I think it's a relatively simple thing to then make, the, make, that, make those dots join up. So. And, and could I just lastly, through the convener, ask how, how many um, <coughs> estates are there in, in the remit? Well, um, <laughs> I suppose the easiest thing is, is to answer how many there are exactly the same as this, or at least similar yeah. to it. Just to get a feel for what we're talking about, please, Minister. Sure. Um, just look for my... Yeah, you've got it. Thank you. It's really faster than me. Um, there are uh, currently 30 sporting leases let by the Scottish Government, with uh, leases generally running for about 10 years, so a similar mm -hmm. basis to the one that we have uh, in the case of Rassi now. And it's a relatively unusual um, sort of instance, and the lease was held, obviously, by local crofting association and had been for a very long time. Um, in the context of how many similar ones are coming up. I mean, there are, just for clarity and explain to the committee, there are four sporting leases due for renewal in the next 12 months and eight in total in the next two years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, the, the, we have already taken steps in the case of a, a site in uh, Newton shootings in Western Isles to give them an extension while we waited the outcome of the consultation to see what lessons might be learned from mm -hmm. that. So okay. uh, we will take forward the principles um, that we've established now in dealing with RASI in our subsequent handling of the Newton shootings in, in Western Isles. Um, so uh, there's a very, very small number that are in, uh, in the immediate future that are coming forward on the same basis. Uh, but as I say, a total of 30 states, uh, sporting rights, sorry, uh, of this nature. Thank you, Minister. So, just for information, I think I see that, that was, it was at Newton that the charter was originally launched. So that's cool. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> time. Interesting discussion about this charter, about which we never heard anything in my experience in the Rural Committee between 2003 and 2007 uh, and uh, its application uh, emerging from a cupboard uh, in terms of this situation. Um, does it really, well there's been a lot of developments in land reform since yeah. then and also in uh, relation to uh, the way in which the community's aspect of uh, the government policy has, has developed. So would there be um, some means for reviewing what the state's charter said and see whether how it would be how it could be perhaps uh, looked at and worded in a fashion that fits the relationship with uh, the finance manual and how this government might respond to that in future well that's um, i have to be honest it's something that we've not looked at or planned for at this stage uh, convener but certainly happy to to come back to the committee with how we might do that if if if, if indeed it's uh, an issue you want us to, to address. Um, clearly, the estates charter is being, as, as I've sort of explained, is, is being applied, um, albeit in this case uh, not with the, the outcome that perhaps the community would have uh, would have wanted, or indeed I would have wanted. Um, but you know, the, the, the estates charter is still being used to inform our estates management. So maybe refreshing that and having a look at um, how it applies in uh, in the current context might be might be appropriate. Oh, I think it would be, given that it's been re-raised, you know, after a long period of at least, you know, no discussion, maybe dormancy even, but uh, there we are. Um, it's worth, worth stating and, and convening, I mean, clearly, you know, just for the record, I mean, the Scottish Government very much believes in empowering communities and indeed with the land, land reform uh, legislation we already have is trying to uh, promote greater degree of community ownership. I, so I'd put on the record that uh, it certainly fits with our aspirations to, to take into account community interests. Just to take it back to RASI, it's a question that's just occurred to me as we're talking. The RASI Crofters Association, is that made up purely of RASI Crofters? Or are there, are there other residents on the island who are members of it? Well, I, I haven't come here and looked in detail at the uh, membership of the Rassi Crofters Association. I know that um, clearly uh, some demonstration of, of linkage to, to uh, crofting would, would be implied in the name, um, but I'm happy to look at, at, at that. But uh, certainly it's not an issue that's, that's been formally raised as part of the, the consultation in terms of the composition of the, uh, the, the RCA itself. But there was a desire, I suppose, within the responses we received to have as much transparency and openness about the operation of the sporting rights. No desire among the consultation responses we've had uh, to interfere with the operation of the RCA itself in terms of its ongoing activities, but certainly an interest in ensuring transparency about the sporting rights and its management. I wasn't suggesting for one minute we should interfere in their activities, but uh, it would be interesting to know who were the members, and you can maybe just write to us about that. Yeah. Uh, because 
obviously the that, future of a, a fragile community as you describe it has got to bring together as many people who can actually help to build the economy there as possible. I suppose it's one, one uh, dimension of the transparency that we're looking for as well going forward that people understand who it is that benefits from the sporting rights and uh, how much of the wider benefit goes to the community as well. So that's something we can address in terms of lease. Thank you. Richard Lyle. Yeah, um, Minister, you said earlier that there are several others uh, are going to come up for lease, uh, a lease renewal in the next couple of years. Uh, can I suggest, will you be doing any consultation, local consultation, before you make your decision or your officials make a decision on any of these leases? And would you also keep the local MSPs, both constituency and region, in the loop? Can I suggest that that be in order to ensure that uh, there's no upset in the future? I think that's a constructive suggestion in terms of keeping local members informed. Clearly, in this case, uh, not just not just local members, but myself were caught, you know, <laughs> caught up, uh, you know, with the with the news of what happened. So I think um, I think having a procedure whereby members are aware, so they can actually engage and make sure. I think it's obviously important that uh, uh, to to note that you know, we need to make sure the community do engage with us at appropriate times. So if if there is a notice to quit, sir, it's essential that we enlist the support, if you like, of local members, uh, of Scottish Parliament MPs, and, and others to to ensure the community do respond either positively or negatively as to whether they want to continue with the sporting rights or if they have an interest in changing the terms of the lease so that we know uh, those things can be taken into account in framing the subsequent discussions. Uh, so that's very helpful. I mean, it's worth pointing out that, and it's, it's not to, uh, to, to, to be critical in any way, but just a matter of fact that when the notice was to quit was served, uh, as I understand, I wasn't the minister at the time, Cooley, but as I understand that the notice uh, to serve, the notice to quit was served in 1st November 2011, uh, there was very little contact, if any, from the RCA between then and the lease actually coming out onto the market. Mm. In fact, the only contact we had was to discuss um, an indication, to ask for an indication of the value, which clearly they couldn't, the officials couldn't give because that would have interfered with the, the tendering process itself. So there was no contact really uh, made. But had there been contact and had we been aware, uh, perhaps, of the strength of feeling uh, within the Rassie Crofters Association and the wider community, then perhaps that might have rung some alarm bells and might have brought the situation to a happier ending. Um, so I think it is, um, you're quite right, uh, Mr Lyle, that if we engage with local members who are on the ground and know the circumstances, um, then that may well help assist us in, in addressing these problems in the future. Yeah. I'd like to thank the Minister and his team for uh, that forthright discussion and the welcome news about the lease for the Rassie Crofters Association. We will no doubt hear more about uh, the subject in due course, but we hope it's of a happy nature rather than a crisis. So thank you for bringing that to our attention and our details, uh, Minister. Uh, we will be uh, finishing the meeting now by saying that at our next meeting, the committee will have a round table evidence session on climate change behaviour uh, change and with stakeholders and with uh, consideration of an approach paper on climate change adaptation, just to show the breadth of what we do here. So thank you, everybody. That ends the meeting formally.